Production. Recorded live. Hello, everyone. It's Thursday, December the 9th, and the uh, end of the year is closing in on us quickly tonight. We have a, a, a special guest. We have Gene Keating on with us tonight, and he's going to cover a lot of topics. Um, he says he's going to cover tax law, commercial law, accounting law, trust law, adverse claims, and void judgments. Uh, he's going to touch on those and explain a little bit uh, about those and why we're not winning in our cases. Hi, Gene. How are you? I'm fine. Great. Great to have you with us. Um, for those that don't know you, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Just a little intro. Mostly everybody knows who you are, but... <laughs> well, I've been teaching for 50 years. I've been doing research for 50 years. I have a degree in commercial banking law and commercial law. And I... Understand the Uniform Commercial Code. I understand trust law. Does that apply? All these are all these four subjects are related. <clears throat> you have to understand tax law, trust law, commercial law, and accounting. If you don't, you can't understand anything that's going on. And that's part of the problem is when people go into court, they don't know what kind of jurisdiction the court's operating under. So what did you discover about all this stuff that we're doing? How are we doing it wrong? Well, if you go in there, the, these courts are not, uh, these courts have two jurisdictions. They have a, prob, a, a public side, which operates on in commercial, and a private side, which operates under the common law. And their courts of contract. If you go in there and contract with them, they got jurisdiction. How do you not contract with them? Well, you make a special appearance. You do, okay. like I did. I did a letter rogatory, and every time I've done one, I've been successful with it. You got to read 3-501 and 3-502. It tells you how to do a conditional acceptance upon proof of claim. You have to challenge their right, and most of these people are making presentments on behalf of somebody else. And they don't ever tell you what their authority to do that is. When they do these loans, that's what they're doing on a mortgage loan. They're making a presentment on behalf of somebody else. Well, they don't have any authority to do that, but if you don't challenge it, then they get away with it. You could kill all these mortgages at the, at the administrative level without ever getting into court. They should never get to court. What do you do uh, if you're in a, a state that's not judicial, though? They never go to court anyway. What do you do in that case? Well, judicial, like Ohio's a judicial court, they file a complaint against you. And I know, but in... A non-judicial. Okay, well, non-judicial, they, they, uh, <clears throat> they do a, uh, they can't do that. They can't do a non-judicial foreclosure because it's a confessed judgment. The deed mm -hmm. of trust contains a confessed judgment. And you can't have a, that's where they get the power. To, go read the power of sale clause in your deed of trust. Are, are you still there? Yeah, I'm listening to you. Okay, when you, when you, when it goes in, when the loan goes into default, they have the right under a power of sale. That's a confessed judgment. In California, under 1131 through 1134 of the California Civil Code, you cannot do a confessed judgment on a mortgage loan unless the borrower has consented to it. And that means that he has to file an oath and an order with the court and it has to be certified by an attorney. All of these deeds of trust contain a confessed judgment. That's number one. 
Number two is you're not dealing in a mortgage loan. You're dealing in an investment contract. And they're holding you liable on a contract to which you're not the, not a party, and that's the pooling and servicing agreement. And under the statute of frauds, which is 1624, section 1624 of the California Civil Code, and it's in the Uniform Commercial Code at 2201, section 2201, and the statute of frauds was designed to prevent the very thing that they're doing. And it, the statute of frauds is evidentiary. And if you don't raise it, you waive it. And I don't know of one person who has ever raised the statute of fraud as a defense. It's evidentiary. And the landmark decision on that is, is the Seacrest case. Because when you go to closing, what they're doing is they're, do, they're doing a loan modification. Because they made you a party to a contract to which you're not a party to. You're a third party co you're a third party contractee to the pooling and servicing agreement. And the proof of that is that's where your mortgage payments are going. Your mortgage payments go to the investors as a cash flow claim. They're not going to the servicing company. The servicing company merely passes them on. They pass them on to the investor. Why are they giving them to the investor? <laughs> Another thing that you need to you need to study is you're dealing in securities, not negotiable instruments. What you call a promissory note is a security because it has a, a maturity of more than nine months. All these mortgages have 30-year and 20-year maturities. And if you read Title 15, Section 78, CA 10, it says any note that has a maturity of nine months or less is excluded from the definition of a security. Because it's not a security, it's a note. Where have you ever seen one promissory note that has a maturity of nine months or less? You, you, you haven't. And they also, there's a disclaimer that's supposed to be in the credit application. Under Title 16, 16 CFR 433.2, which says that the buyer or the, the seller takes it subject to all the defenses and claims that the buyer could have... Uh, could assert against any transferee or any buyer who buys it or anybody who sells it. But they take that out of all of these loan applications. None of these mortgage loan applications have that disclaimer in them. That means that you have a de so that means there's no holder in due course. Because if you read 3302 of the Uniform Commercial Code, a holder in due course takes it free of all claims and defenses that the payor could have could assert against any payee or assignee or transferee. Well, they don't take it free of that. They take it subject to your claims and defenses. Now, what are the claims and defenses that you have? Well, number one, under 3305, you have a claim in recoupment which is a counterclaim. And that's the same language that's in Rule 13 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. And Rule 13 says there's two types of counterclaims. There's a mandatory counterclaim and a permissive counterclaim. A mandatory claim, counterclaim is a claim that arises from the same transaction and occurrence as the plaintiff's claim. Nobody's filing a counterclaim. That's why they're running over you. You can't be a creditor unless you file a counterclaim. That's under 3305 of the Uniform Commercial Code, or 3-305. And your second claim, or defense, is 3306, which says that you have a proprietary 
and possessionary and property interest in the note and its proceeds. And you have the right to rescind negotiation of the transaction. Negotiation means the endorsement on the note. They all they always endorse these notes, pay to the order of. Well, you have a right to rescind that negotiation. But you ne- nobody ever does it because they don't read the Uniform Commercial Code. I've been teaching for 50 years, and I haven't found anybody in the in the Patriot community that reads that, that reads the Uniform Commercial Code. They don't read all these applicable statutes. And when you have when you're dealing in securities, it's governed by Article Eight, not Article Three, because the, what you call a note is a security and it's a non-negotiable instrument. If you read the adjustable, and most of these subprime mortgages have an adjustable rate rider that goes with the with the note. The just, the adjustable rate rider modifies the conditions of payment and makes it, it says it supplements and governs the promissory note. And if you read 3-106D, it says it can't be a negotiable instrument if it's subject or governed by another, by extraneous documents outside the, of the promissory note. And they, they make it subject to the adjustable rate rider and the deed of trust. And I have a dozen cases that say all mortgage notes are non-negotiable instruments. Well, they're, if they're not if they're non-negotiable instruments, they're not governed by Article Three. They're governed by general contract law, specifically Restatement of the Law, Second Series, under Contract Section 164, which has to do with misrepresentation, which means it's subject to rescission. But nobody ever rescinds anything. If you read 226.23 of TILA, or Regulation Z, that's 12 CFR, that's the Code of Electronic Regulations, Federal Code of Electronic Regulations. You've got to go into the electronic version. And if you go into the appendix, they have a form in there, in Appendix H. They have rescission forms. And they're called H-8 and H-9 in the appendix of 226.23. And if the lender doesn't give you, they not only have to tell you of your right to rescind, but they have to give you the form to do the rescission. That's all in 226.23. Now, it says in there that it doesn't apply to residential mortgage loans. But you go down to Section H, it says that at foreclosure, you have the right to rescind the loan transaction if two things occurred, there was no mortgage broker fee charged, and you weren't given the you weren't given notice of the right to rescind or the appropriate form, either one of those three things, they didn't give you the form which is in appendix. It's an H8 form, H H dash eight and H dash nine. So you can rescind the transaction when it goes into foreclosure. They'll tell you that you can't. You only got 72 hours. If they didn't give you notice, the, stat, the, the statute of limitations does not toll until they tell you you have a right to rescind. So you can do it at foreclosure. And another thing is you're not in a loan transaction. You're in an investment contract. 4-102 under applicability. It says if an item is includable in Article 3, it's, it's governed by Article 8. Article 8 governs Article 3. Why does it? Because you're dealing in securities. All these notes are securities, not notes or negotiable instruments. So Article 8 governs 3 and 4, and that's what it says. And what you have to do is you have a claim in in recoupment or a claim under 3306 to the proceeds and a right to rescind the negotiation, and you have a possessionary and property right in the proceeds of the investment contract. But nobody ever files a claim. And if you read 8-505, 
through 8-508, it tells you how to file a claim. And the claim is called an adverse claim. And it's defined in 8-102, and it's defined in 8-105 of Article 8. Nobody uses Article 8. And all these mortgage transactions are governed by Article 8, not Article 3 or Article 2. They're all governed by Article 8. And you have a counterclaim. You never file the counterclaim. That's why when they go into foreclosure, they file a 1099-A, saying that you abandon your claim, your recoupment, which is a counterclaim, and your possessionary right to the proceeds from the sale of the security under the investment contract to which you are an undisclosed third party. And nobody understands that. You're an undisclosed third party to a contract under the statute of frauds. And if they're going to hold you liable under a contract to which you're an undisclosed third party and, you're, and, you, and it hasn't been subscribed to by you or memorialized, then you have a right to the proceeds from the transaction, and nobody files a counterclaim going after the proceeds. And it tells you how to do that, and nobody's doing that. That's one of the reasons that, you, that you're losing in court. A, the, another reason you're losing in court is because none of these courts, and I mean none, you know what I mean by N-O-N-E? None of these <laughs> courts have... Subject matter jurisdiction over land, only a land court. And in Florida, the only land courts are your county courts, and it says that in the Constitution. If you go into the judiciary of the Florida Constitution and look up Article 5, Section 20, it tells you what courts are have jurisdiction. And your county courts have jurisdictions over land. None of these courts. So what you do is you go in there and contract with people that don't have subject matter jurisdiction. None of these attorneys, these attorneys don't have, they don't have jurisdiction to represent anybody. And if you go read the dead man statutes, which they pa passed under probate law, your dead man statutes were codified under Rule 601 of the Federal Rules of, of Evidence. And what it says, it goes to competency to testify. They're incompetent to testify on behalf of a dead person. Now, who is the dead person? It's all of these corporations. They're all decedents. They're dead persons because they're not real. And what the attorney does is you let them come in there and they start testifying on behalf of all these banks. And if you don't raise the objection, that's the first thing I do. I am before this court by special appearance without waiving any rights, remedies, or defenses, statutory or, statutory or procedural. I put that admonition at the top of my pleadings. That way you don't waive jurisdiction. Otherwise, you're going in there and contracting with, this, with these people. You contract with them, and then when they rule against you, even though they didn't have subject matter jurisdiction, you gave them that. You gave them jurisdiction, but not subject matter. But you got to raise it. And nobody raises in subject matter and in persona. In order to, for the court to have jurisdiction, the plaintiff has to be there and the defendant. You have to have both parties, real parties and interests, that have standing. Under Article 3, Section 2, standing is a threshold issue, and the court is supposed to address that sua sponte, but they're not doing it. Some of them do, and some of them don't. So you have the responsibility to bring that up because that's a threat. Standing is a threshold issue. None of these servicing companies that are foreclosing on all these loans, none of them have standing to come into court and foreclose on your loan. 
And the reason is because they don't own the loans. Who owns the security? The borrower does. That's why this Countrywide, in the Kemp case, this woman from, who's an employee of Countrywide came in and testified in court that none of the notes are transferred. That means that all of these real estate investment trusts, which they call Remix, don't have the notes. And April Charney, if you read her admonitions on this, she says that they never transfer the notes, nor do they sell them. They keep the notes. And the reason they keep them, and the reason they, they keep them is because they don't own them. They can't transfer them. And if they did transfer them, they have to do that to get the exemption. Otherwise, they have to pay taxes. If they don't pay out 90% of their taxable income in interest and dividends to the investors, then they have a tax liability. And they do not qualify under Section 862 and 852 of Title 26 as a real estate investment trust. So they're in possession of contraband. So what they're doing is billing you for the tax that they owe. And everybody goes in, nobody raises this issue because they don't understand it. That's why every mortgage is a tax issue. It actually involves two things. It involves an investment contract and a tax. And the reason the tax comes into play is because they never transferred the security. They kept these securities. So that means that all these investors that bought, that bought cash flow claims under the pooling and servicing agreement have got worthless paper. That means there's a cloud on every title and none of these notes were ever securitized. That means every B-5 prospectus and S-3 registration statement and 8K current report is, are all invalid that are filed with the Securities Exchange Commission because they, the notes, the, the securities were never transferred at closing. And these investors put up all of this capital and <clears throat> I have a law review article written by David Levithan that goes into the ramifications of this. That means that the banks that allegedly financed all these loans are gonna to have to give all this money back to the investors as cash flow claims because they never transferred. They bought something that they never got. They paid for all these notes or securities and they were never transferred to them. So they don't own any of them. So the banks are gonna to have to give and there's not enough money in all of the banks to pay these investors back. So what does that mean? So you're gonna have a put back, and that's what this, this, this professor that wrote this article went up and testified before Congress on the, on the, the, the sub-finance committee under community housing. He testified before Congress what's gonna happen if Congress doesn't do something. Now, what are they going to do? It's going to be remains to be seen, but I'm telling you what the ramifications of this are. China probably is going to come in here and buy up all the, all this all these loans, and that means or either that or they they'll bail out everybody, either that or they'll confiscate all your money in the banks. One of those two things is going to happen. You stand by and watch. And in response to the young lady that asked about the 1099 OID, all these people that are going around filing 1099 OIDs, 1096s, 1040, 1040 Vs, they're not filing 8281s. An 8281 identifies who the issuer of the OID is under Title 10, Section 78CA8. That's a small c, 78C, small a, parentheses, 8, the number 8. Go read it. It identifies you as the issuer. And because you didn't identify yourself as the issuer, you don't have a claim. That's why it says in Publication 1212 on page 2, 
that you it must the 8281 form must be filed when you file the OID. This is what this this is what happens when people don't read anything. They're listening to what other people are telling them. And people are not reading these publications. That's why the IRS publish, publishes these publications because they tell you how to file for an OID, original issue discount. And it tells you what forms you have to file. Also, if you read your deed of trust, and this is in every deed of trust under payments, which in almost all of them is number three. And if you could go read it, if you don't believe me, this is what I mean by nobody reads anything. People complain about all this lack of disclosure, but they never read the deed of trust, and it tells you what they're doing. And it tells you that if there's any money owed at maturity, you can pay it at maturity. So let me ask you a question. How can the note be in default if you have the right by contract, the deed of trust is a contract, and you sign the deed of trust? How can they foreclose on the note when you can make the, any delinquent payment at maturity on the note under the deed of trust? So how can the, how can the mortgage be in, in uh, foreclosure? Default. How can it be in default? You ever heard that before? Yeah. No. Read every word, every word, every sentence, every phrase. It's an unconscionable contract. It has clogging provisions in it. You know what clogging is? Clogging provisions are provisions that extinguish your equity of redemption. If they sell your security, how are you going to redeem it if they sell it to somebody else and give you the note back? Don't you always have the, the right to redeem a loan? That's war proof that it's not a loan. It's an investment contract. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, hold on one second. Let me bring up the questions. Ohio. Go ahead, Ohio. Did you have a question? Ohio. <laughs> Ohio, are you there? Ohio. No, we did, we forgot to mute. We want to mute. Oh, okay. Star six? Oh, is, yeah, star six. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. All right, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, Hi Angela. I have a question for Gene. Go right ahead. Gene, uh, there's been another gentleman on the Internet recently talking about what he calls your ABCs. His name happens to be Patrick Devine. Are you familiar with him by chance? Yeah, he's one of my students. He, oh, well, I happen to think, sir, that he is probably dead on what's going on, and evidently you you must agree if you say he's your student. I haven't seen what he's teaching lately, so I don't know if he if he what he's teaching. So, well, it, it's going along with exactly what you're saying. Is it possible that I can send you some information for you to review? Sure. Fantastic. If I could get your email, if someone would type, Angela, would you be kind enough to type an email in for me in the chat so I can send Gene some information and then I have another question. Uh, Gene, you, you talk about a form. Uh, what was the form you were just talking about that must go in with the 1099 OID? It was an 88 something? 82. 82, 81. There's three forms. Okay. All you have to do is follow the 8281, but you should read the instruction booklet on the 8281.
There's an 8282 and an 8283. I su- I'm suggesting that you read all three of them. Okay. Now, another question for you. Let me bring let me bring something to your attention attention. And this yes, is sir. This is really powerful. In 1951, they passed the law under Title 26, Section 2038, and Section 2514. It's called the Power of Appointment Act of 1951. The donor has total power. Every one of these mortgage loan transactions is a donor donee relationship, which means it's a Class 5 gift and estate tax under the 60209 decoding manual. If you go to the IRS website and download it, it's called the IRS Processing Manual of 2010. If you go in there and read it, it tells you that all 1096s, all 1098s, all 1040s, all 1099s, all W-2s, are you guys getting this? All W-2s, all W-4s, are Class 5 gift and estate taxes. They have nothing to do with an income tax. And everybody's filing 1040 forms. You don't report gift and estate taxes on a 1040 form. You report income on a 1040. That's number one. All Class 5 gift and estate taxes are done on a 706 form or a 709. On a 706 form, it's a generation skipping transfer tax. You should read the instruction book on a 706. I go into this stuff in my classes, and we have classes every Tuesday night. And this is some of the stuff that I cover. You have, under the 709 form, which is a gift tax form, see, there's two types of taxes, generation skipping transfer tax, which is what the 706 is for, and a gift tax, which is what the 709 is for. And if you go read publication 950, you have a $3,500,000 unified tax credit. That means if you know anything about accounting, corporations use that $3,500,000 as money. Corporations use tax credit as money. They actually will give tax credits to banks, and banks will loan money on the tax credits. You have a $3,500,000 unified tax credit under Publication 950 on all estate taxes. You have a $1 million unified tax credit or exclusion on the gift side. And they build that. If you read the 709 form, they build the exclusion. You have a a, a $348,000 and it's built into the form. It's actually in the form. And I know that none of you wage owners that, that have wages make more than $348,000. Uh, What's Gene, wrong with this picture? Uh, so, okay, first off, I'd like to say this is that now he's, he, Patrick talks about it being very important every time you send in your 1099A for acquisition or abandonment that you have to send in a Form 56. Yeah, so you point a fiduciary. Right. So is the is the Form 56 and this Form 8281, are they somewhat maybe similar? No. Oh, okay. So, the so 8281 one, identifies you as the issuer of the OID. Okay. That's why they're penalizing people on these OIDs. O- okay. Let, now, let, let me ask you, if you would, here for me. I go back to, I always go back to McFadden's speech on the floor of the House in the 1930s, sir. And he says, Mr. Speaker, if this bill becomes law, a Scottish distiller will be able to draw up his bill and present it to the Federal Reserve window and have his money before he ever produces the whiskey. Now, I didn't write that, sir, but that is what it says. Then that means that each and every one of us are running a corporation. We on this end have tended to call that the straw man, but it's a business. 
and we have the ability then to draw up our bill and send it to the Federal Reserve window and get our money every year before we ever start doing business in our particular businesses that we might call uh, Gene Keating all caps or Angela Stark all caps or whatever. Am I wrong, sir? No, you're absolutely right. I can show you how to do that. So every single one of us have the power individually, individually, without going and getting involved in a big group. If we just learn how to run our banks, we have the ability to take back and inherit what the Bible might call the kingdom of God. Would you argue with that? You're absolutely right. Okay. So, in other words, what it, what, what the wizard told Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, Oz was, all you had to do is click your heels together. The remedy's been with you the whole time. Would you agree with that? Yes, it has. Okay. So it sounds to me like, uh, I I tell you what I would love to see, sir. I would love to see you and Patrick get together. It sounds like he's using your information and strengthening this thing so each and every one of us can finally find our remedy because it's been withheld from us for, for years and years and years because my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Would you disagree with that? Nope. That's fantastic. We have special drawing rights on the IMF. Did you know that? Well, that sounds to me like what I'm saying is all we have to do is take our... I know you can go to the Small Business Administration today. My folks did it in, in their business, and you can present up a plan to them, a business plan, and they'll fund the plan. I just never realized that they were just... All they were doing was taking your Social Security number as the account number, and they're going through there and funding the thing because we have that right because we're creditors to the corporation. That's right. What, you, all of these corporations are debtors in possession. Under Chapter 11 reorganization. And each and every one of us are the creditors to the United States. Am I correct, sir? Yes. Okay. So each and every one of us have had our remedy, and we're sitting around bitching and moaning and complaining and crying about what Obama and all these people are doing, and they don't mean diddly squat to us. Every one of us has got our remedy right this minute, and it's as easy as ABC. 1099As. B's and C's, and if you know how to use them, you can run your whole bank, because it says we're each one of us bankers under Title 31 of the United States Code. Am I correct, sir? Yeah. Okay. So we all have our remedy. We just have to quit being stupid. Am I correct? Amen. Okay. I'll get off the call and let someone else talk. Thank you for your time very much, and thank you, Angela. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, we'll move on. Let's see. Texas, go ahead. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Hey, what's going hey. on? Hi. Hey, um, I did a 1099 ORD uh, for the last uh, four years, and um, for 2006, 7, and 8, um, you said that I need to do a Form 8281. How do I fill out the form for a checking account or a savings account? That's what all I did, the 1099 ORD, um, was my money of uh, uh, equity. You need to read sections 1271 through 1288 of Title 26. Everything is an OID because it's a public debt instrument. Okay. So, like, I'm looking at the... When you, look at, when you, when you write a check, it's a public debt instrument. Right. Okay. You 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 issue it as as an original issue discount or a withdrawal. Okay. But for example, on this eighty two eighty one form, you have to have a QCIP number. That's what. That's why you, all you guys are doing. Everybody that's doing redemption is doing it wrong. When they send you a bill, you know what they're doing. You know what the bill represents that they send you. A uh, presentment or. I don't know. It represents the amount of, amount of your credit that they're using. All oh, right, All right. Okay, you have to file a tax return and assess the tax. That's why they never redeemed the debt, because you never assessed it, because it's a tax. And you're the only one that can assess it, because it's your credit they're using. If you don't report it as income to the IRS, how is the IRS going to give you a refund?
So that's where the 1099 RID comes in. I report it as income. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. You do a pay order on the bill. Pay to the order of the Department of Treasury. Charge the sum said to the person that sent you the bill, the utility company. Then say cre- cre- credit or, or uh, credit it to the then put you put credit to your account and put your social security number there. But that sounds like uh, A for V. Look a little bit. Well, it's not an A for B. It's a it's a money order. Okay. You're paying the the tax to the IRS, and then the IRS can turn around and bill the account of the person that sent you the bill. You're not doing that, so they're billing you for it. They're double dipping. They go into your account and get the money, and then they send you the coupon, which is a check. And you never use the coupon. You send it back to them. So they take the coupon and they keep these coupons. And they're they're their check. That's a check. Plus the check you sent to them, you paid them twice. They're getting paid twice for every transaction they do with you. If you think that isn't what's going on, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. They assessed an eighty thousand dollar fine on me. The district court did. I did a pay to the order of. I never heard of heard from them again. They have to pay the tax on eighty thousand dollars. Remember, every bill is a tax bill. Okay, so you said I would take each bill uh, that they send me, do a pay to the order of, and I send it to the IRS. Yeah, pay IRS. Them. you send the you send the uh, the original to the IRS, and you send a copy to the person that sends you the bill. Along with a 1040 V, a 1040, and a 1096, and an OID. A 1040. And, yeah. Oh wow. You put that in there as income. Okay. That's, and you're reporting it to the IRS as income. How and many 1040s I, are you saying you can file in a year, Gene? Well, it depends on how many transactions you have. <laughs> I thought you so can I, only do one 1040 for the year. Well, you can wait and do it at the end of the year. Put all your transactions on one form. Okay, I, I need to look at an example, an example of that because that's. Uh, <laughs> I guess it sounds pretty simple, but you know that's a lot of stuff. Well, you, you just know. have to understand what's going on. It's right. your money they're using, and you're not reporting it. Right. Just like so, who, who reports? Who keeps track of when you write a check? Don't you keep a record of the check you wrote? Right. Yes, I do. Okay. Well, you, okay. How are you going to balance? Who balances your check? Your checking account? You do. Right. Okay. Well, the IRS can't balance your account, credit account, unless you file a return reporting the income. You have to do it because it's your income. Right. Okay, so for my situation where I have already filed a 1099 ID and the IRS is coming back to me saying that I have to correct what I did, or I'll get a five thousand dollar penalty. How do, do pay I... the order on their bill? Do you know the IRS has a Duns number? Right, I've heard that before. Well, it's true. I got their Duns number. I know what their Duns number is. Okay, but uh, okay. What they're tr- what they're doing is they're trying to find out if you know what you're doing or not. Right. And everybody goes into panic palace. Oh my God, the IRS is after me. <laughs> it's time to run for the hills. Right. They're they're testing you to see if you know what you're doing. Okay. Every- so fails. They they don't do anything. They sit on it. They don't do anything. They're telling you that they're they're double dipping. Okay. So uh, do I still send in the eighty two eighty one in this case since I've already sent in ten nine L I D or? Yeah, I fill out an eighty two eighty one and send it in. You're not an issuer unless you file an eighty two eighty one because the the tw- publication twelve twelve says you must 
Must means mandatory. Must okay. file an 8281. But I haven't met one person that even knows what an 8281 is. Right. That's because nobody's reading anything. Nobody. Right. Everybody's going around listening to what everybody's telling everybody. They listen to Winston Shroud, Gordon Hall, Jack Smith, Tim Turner. Nobody goes out and 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 does any research and reads anything. anything. That's why they don't don't uh, uh, know what's going on. Okay. These courts. So, n- none of these courts have jurisdiction to do anything. They're not courts. Right. They're privately owned trading companies. And I don't go in there and contract with. Them. I make I make a contract with them on the private side, and then I control it by conditional acceptance. If you do right. a con- conditional acceptance right, you can blow them out of the water. I stopped a sixty thousand dollar car loan by writing a letter to the judge. He not only took the case off the calendar, he dismissed the motion for default judgment and the motion for an order for writ of possession. Dismissed both of them and took the case off the calendar. Okay. All right, so for as gotta far go as on this, the private I- you're going in there on the public side with courts that have no jurisdiction. Even though they don't have jurisdiction, you're contracting with them. And you give them jurisdiction by contract. <clears throat> they can contract with you, and that's what they... Uh, I don't go in there and contract with them. Okay. I said, where's your authority? I'll accept that on proof of claim. Where do you, where do you get to... What's your authority for making a presentment on behalf of somebody else? And 99.9% of these people are making presentments on behalf of somebody else. And do do they ever, when these banks on a mortgage foreclosure, when they make a presentment, do they ever send you the note? Did you know that they have to present the instrument too? Not only do they have to tell you their authority for making the presentment on behalf of somebody else, and they're all doing it, but they have to give you the, the instrument. They have to exhibit the instrument. Do you ever make them exhibit the instrument? Nope. Did you know that if you get the abstract of title, and I think the title companies are holding these, that, that, that the loan was paid in full at closing? It actually says that? They're called title yeah. papers? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh the uh, title company has those? Yeah, they have the abstract of title, which is the record of the deeds and the notes and all of your loan papers, where they've been, who's using them. It keeps a record of this. The title company has all this. So I will ask the title company for the abstract of title. Yeah, t- tell them you want to know who the errors and omissions, who's holding the insurance policies on errors and omissions. Did you know you have an error and omission claim on all these mortgage loans? Did you know that under the under RESPA, they cannot receive any kickback on a mortgage loan, on a federally funded mortgage loan? And all these notes are federally funded. They call them mortgage loans. I'm calling them what they call them. They're really investment contracts. But they violate RESPA, and that's an errors and omissions claim, which you can collect on. Okay. You need to come to my class on Tuesday night. We have right. a, we have four. We're gonna we're gonna have more classes on Tuesday okay. night. We have a class, and I go into all this stuff. Right, right. I'll definitely be there. Um, but as far as this eighty two eighty one, uh, for example, the Cusick number. Do I put in my social security number or uh, the issue date, the maturity date, the type of instrument? Uh, I'm looking at the fields of like, okay, well, how do I actually fill them out, you know. You mean the 8281? Yes. Well, it, it, uh, let, me, let me pull one up here. This is how you identify who the issuer is. 
Right. And you're not you're not doing that. Information returned for publicly offered original issue discount instruments. You know what for Apple one oh four says? Say that again. For Apple one oh four of the Uniform Commercial Code. Do you know what it says? No. It says originator it defines what an originator is. Originator of the first funds transfer. Okay. Then when you go read 3105 of the Uniform Commercial Code, it tells you who the issue is and who the issuer is. And it says under subsection C, uh, so under subsection A, it defines what the issue is. That's the first payment order on a funds transfer. Okay. Number C defines what issuer is. And it says an issuer is the drawer and the maker. Now, if you've got a mortgage and you sign a mortgage note, you're an issuer by legal definition. Does that tell you anything? What did you sign? You endorsed the security. Well, don't you have a proprietary interest in the proceeds from the sale of that security? Since they're making you a party to the investment contract? Absolutely. Well, so why aren't you claiming it? We will be now. <laughs> right. Do you understand why people are not winning in court? That's an Article 8 claim, adverse claim. Go look up what an adverse claim is. You know, here, I'll, I'll read it to you. Let me pull up the UCC and I'll read it to you. And you can see how this thing works. Cool. This is what I go into on, on my classes. I'm giving you manna. This is manna from heaven. <laughs> but they said manna didn't have any taste to it. <laughs> well, this doesn't. <laughs> this is this is uh uh this is all uh this is all manna. And definitely I'm gonna go into the definitions. It says an adverse claim, and this is eight dash one oh two subsection A one adverse claim means a claim that a claimant has a property interest in a financial asset and that it is a violation of the rights of the claimant for another person to hold, transfer, or deal with the financial asset. Okay, now go down to 8-109, 8-102, subsection 9. It says a, a financial asset is a security. Well... So you've got a uh, you've got a, a property interest in a financial asset, isn't that what three three hundred six says? Property interest. Mm -hmm. And when you go to eight one hundred five, you have security. It says a person has notice of an adverse claim if the person knows of the adverse claim. Don't you think they know that you have an adverse claim? So they already had notice of it at closing. And don't, aren't they aware of facts sufficient to, to indicate that there is a significant probability that the adverse claim exists and it deliberately avoids information that would establish evidence of the adverse claim? Don't they have a duty imposed by statute or regulation to investigate whether an adverse claim exists? And don't they have knowledge that a financial asset or interest therein in or has been transferred? All of this, 8-105. And then you go to 8-505, it tells you how to file the claim. 
Well, they're going to love me. Right. This is what you call love at first sight. I'm going to have to uh, listen to this call again anyway. But um, You funded the whole thing. If you read uh, on the Internet, they have an affidavit written by Neil Garfield that goes into this whole thing. The only thing that that he's not correct in, and he says the the money came from the investors on a pay what they call a pay forward. In other words, before they ever had a lend, before they ever had a borrower in place, they had the capital. So the the investors put up the capital for these real real estate investment trusts before they ever had a mortgage loan, but they did it. Under uh, on on the condition that you put up a security, doesn't that make you the creditor? Wasn't the the, mon- the capital that the investor put put up predicated on the security that you gave to the le- to the servicing company at closing? Right. You, your bippy it was. So aren't you? Didn't you give them the, the instrument or the capital for the investor's money? It wasn't. Right. The, the 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 pay forward done by the investors before there was ever a loan in place? Yeah, but the investors' money didn't really go to my security. What it went to was for the bankers and lenders to buy uh, insurance and credit default swaps and to fund their, uh, a pool of money so they can pay back the investors. Yeah, but they put that capital based on your security that you issued. That gives you a proprietary interest in it. Okay, if you went through all the securities from this uh, pooling and servicing agreement and from the trust fund, what would they have? Nothing. So they didn't have the right to invest this money if they didn't have my security. That's right. They would have never put the capital up in the first place unless they were guaranteed a, 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 a capital from the borrower. So the borrower has a proprietary interest in the proceeds from the security. But you're not making the claim. And that's why they put the the disclaimer in 16 CFR 433.2. Go read it. They take it subject to all the defenses and claims that you can assert against the seller. Well, they're not they can't be a holder because a holder takes it free of all defenses and claims. So they're not holders in due course. Well, if they're not a holder in due course, what does 3-305 say? Let's go read it. You wonder why you're losing in court? 3-305. Because we're not treating this as a contract. Defenses and claims and recruitment. Recoupment. That means counterclaim. Go look it up. Yeah. Okay. I'm definitely going to have to listen to this call again, like I said, and uh, go through all this stuff. If you go read C, 3-305C, it says an obligor is not obliged to pay the instrument if the person seeking enforcement of the instrument does not have rights of a holder in due course. What does that tell you? If they're taking it subject to your claims and defenses, are they a holder in due course? Right. Oh no. Well, doesn't that say you don't have to pay it? Right. Well, so why are they why are they foreclosing on your property when they're not a holder in due course? Because they're still in the property. Because you're not raising the defense. That's why. And you're not in a land court. You're in a privately owned trading company. Privately owned trading company, okay. In California, you know where the county courts are in California? Go read your constitution. Okay. I haven't re- I haven't looked it up yet, but the, the, do they have county courts in California? Yeah, they do. 
Okay, where are they, you know where they're located? Well, I would uh, I would assume that's like where you fight tickets and things like that. Those are the only courts that have jurisdiction over land. None of these courts have jurisdiction over land, and nobody's bringing this up. They go in there, and and and, the, and these courts are are running over them. We got a lot of people in line to ask questions. Shall we move on? Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, I guess to to recap, just to um, just fill out the eighty two eighty one and send it out there. I still don't quite sure how to fill it out, but I'll I'll figure it out somehow. Just put put in who the issuer is. But I don't need to fill out every line. Just as fill out. Well, let me let me let me go over it real quick. Okay, because uh, let me let me that's let me pull it back. Important. Hang on. Sorry. Hang on. Okay, sorry everyone. I know you are waiting, but well, that's a good thing. This is this applies to everybody, not just you. Angela, this, sorry to interrupt, but is my hand raised? Yep, I, I can't see your hand. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's not raised. As it's a matter not. of fact, okay. thanks. Okay, now it is. Okay, now I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Let me let me get let me get let me get this eighty two eighty one up here. Okay, here here it is. My hamster hamster is gonna have a heart attack. I got a I got a computer that's run by a hamster. Yeah, right. It runs on a wheel, and that, and that's what powers my computer. I'd like to see that. The last couple of weeks, he had a heart attack. Oh, poor thing. And I had I had to I had to resuscitate him. <laughs> I said, "Don't leave me now." You have to use a straw or something? Because if you do, it's going to be abandoned property. All right, have you pulled up the form yet? Yeah, I'm, it won't, it was, I'm having a problem getting it. I had it up here, then I closed it off. Okay, here it is. Come on. Okay, here it is. Information returned for publicly offered original issue discount information. What's the number of this form? It's at what? 8180 what? It's 8281. 8281. 8281. Okay. Please fill out the form. Okay. Now, is, is, is it true that, um, like, the applications... Like when you fill out an application for a sample uh, checking account or even a mortgage, that they put a QCIT number, assign a QCIT number to that. Sure, if it's traded, it has a QCIT number because they can't, that's how they identify it. So All maybe your, that's how. You know why it has this QCIT? You know why it has a QCIT number? Because it's no. a security. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. It's not so how do you find that QCIT number? You show me a promissory note with a QCIT number. None of them have right. have QCIT numbers. Only securities have CUSIP numbers. What the hell is going on here? This thing is not coming up. It's not opening up. So maybe we have to find a CUSIP number for, for example, my checking account or whatever. I don't know if they, they probably won't give it to me if there is such a thing. You can give them, you can you can give the DTC your social security. I know a broker. Go to a broker and give me your social and say, I want to know what my bond, or my CUSIP number is. He can tell you in 30 minutes. I don't know why. For my, for my okay. Go where? Ask who? A, a broker. Broker. Any broker will can tell you how to get a. Uh, you can give me your social, and he'll give you a. Uh, I don't know what's the matter with this. Uh, let me. 
That's stuff nice. like it. Isn't it a maximum that you can have that would be insured for a checking account two hundred fifty thousand dollars? So maybe that's yeah amount I can put for the QC. I don't I don't know. I'm just kind of talking out loud. All right, Gene, it's taking too long. You know what? Okay, here it is. I got it open. You got the issuer's name, 1A. The issuer is you. The issuer is taxpayer identification. You know what your taxpayer identification number is? Social Security. Yeah? Okay, then you put your address in 1B. Put the city in 1C. Put the state in 1D. Put the zip code in 1E. It says name of representative. It says see instructions. Read your instructions on this. Then you put down the address in 3C of the representative. That, that I think that would be your broker. Mm-hmm. Then the city. You put the city, state, and zip code. Debt instrument uh, information, it says. Then you got a place for the CUSIP number. Okay, what type of instrument is it? Is yours a fixed rate or a variable rate, which is what a je- adjustable rate? Mm-hmm. And what was the issue price? That's the amount of the mortgage. You see where where it's going with this? What are the interest payments due? What's the OID for, for the entire issue? And what's the yield to maturity? That's the date that the, the value of the instrument at, at maturity. It tells you that. All you do is take 30 and multiply times your 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 uh, payments, and you'll have that okay. description of the debt instruments. Well, you know, it's it's a it's a security financial asset. Right. You can quote 8-102 subsection nine financial asset. Okay. All right, um, I'll go ahead and just research this. Uh, it doesn't really have me as far as my checking account, but um, I'll just have to research that and see if I can figure out what to do about that. Thanks, Angela. Well, okay, just... thank you. you Are you going to re- say something, Gene? Go ahead. Well, you can report your, your withdrawals as debt, debt instruments. If you make right. a withdrawal, that's a debt instrument. Report that as a debt instrument. That's an original issue. Okay. And then the description okay. of debt instruments. Right, but the QCIP number, I don't know, is that my social security number? I don't, I don't know. Uh, no, who knows? They, you, call the, you can go call any broker, give them your social, and say, I want to know what my QCIP number is. They can get okay. it in 30 minutes. All right. Just like that? You just, I want to know what my QCIP number is? Yeah. You so you know what you're talking about. Yeah, tell me you you you, you want to track a bond and you, and you don't have the CUSIP number, and tell give me your social and say I want to I want to know what my CUSIP number is. I have the social for the transaction, but not the CUSIP number. He'll say I'll I'll give it get it for to you in thirty minutes. I did. I've already done this. Okay, I'll okay. try that. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Texas. Okay, thanks, Angela. Thanks, Jane. You're welcome. Okay. Niji. Hello, Jane. Get 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 the one with her hand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you get me? Go ahead. Oh, that's right. Uh we're wait oh, um Nancy was waiting. She was first, but she didn't have her hand up. All right, um, she'll be next. Go ahead, Niji. Okay, Jean. I've got a, a brother that's got a mortgage, and he's in the last week of the redemption period. He's got one week exactly tomorrow night. What would you recommend? Redeem what mortgage? Well, Tell me you want the proceeds. They had, they had sheriff sale on him already, and he, Minnesota has a six-month redemption. And you're in the, in the what? He, he, he's got 
five months and, and, and three weeks into the six months. <laughs> He's got one week left in the, his redemption period, and Friday next week they could have the sheriff uh, escort him out. Has he done a UD? No. What state are you? Are you in a judicial state or non-judicial? Non-judicial, Minnesota. Well, they do a UD to get you out of there. They don't just come out and throw you out. They do an unlawful detainer. Okay. Based on a landlord-tenant agreement. Where's the landlord-tenant agreement? Where did they do... Uh, how did the trustee get... Uh, get uh, uh, see, you haven't laid claim to... You don't have any claim going. That's why they're throwing you out of the house. You haven't filed a claim. How does he go about doing that? Go read uh, 8-505 and 8-508. Okay. you got to find out what? who the uh, broker is or the clearing corporation. And you got to send them a, a written communication. This might be a good time to go into that. I appreciate any help. <laughs> See what I can do for, with them for them. Gene? Yes. Were you going to go any further with that? Yes. I'm going into the UCC. Okay. Hang on to you gotta, your bridge. You gotta, let, you gotta let me know what's happening here. <laughs> What'd it be like? Here we have the Torrens system. Yeah. Sort of. And Torrens land registration system? Yep. Okay, 505 says duty of securities interme intermediary with respect to payments and distribution. A securities intermediary shall take action to obtain a payment or distribution made by the issuer of a financial asset. You know what I would do if I were you? What's that? Other than doing that, I would find out who the title insurance company is. Find out who the error and omissions carrier is. And tell them you want to file a claim. You want to shut this thing. Tell them you want a release of lien and a reconveyance on the property. Because of the errors and omissions claim. And tell them if they don't give you the reason, the title company has the authority to do a release of lien and a reconveyance. Under 29, in California, it's 2941.7. And I don't know what it is. It says if you can't locate the beneficiary of record and, or the landor, which you can't because of the securitization, then you can ask, and they, in 30 days, they have to give you a release of lien or a reconveyance. The trustee does. And you can go to the title company and ask them, tell them you want a release of lien and, and a reconveyance because of the errors and omissions claims you have. Otherwise, you're going to bring a claim. And tell them you want a form for it. Okay. Under 2607 of Title 12. 2607A, go read it. 2607. Of Title 12. Okay, okay. That's what I would do if I were you. They, they'll they call the title company because they're the ones that said the property was free and clear with no encumbrances. They guarantee title, and they're liable if there's any clouding on title. Do it. Let me know what happens. Okay, you mentioned uh, Tuesday... Do you have a Tuesday uh, uh, like talk show or? Yeah, we have we have. Uh, uh, I, I got a on webinar. the program late, so if you said anything, I, I I missed the first part with everything I was doing here. It, it's a webinar. We do. You have to email Toby Butterworth. You do Toby dot Butterworth on Skype. Uh, uh, yeah, Angela has. A, I, yeah, I made a page. Um, if you uh, click. 
click on the link um, where it's where it shows Jean's name on the home page up in the upper right corner, you know, talking about tonight's call. If you click on there, it'll open a page and it has all the links uh, and and more information on how to sign up for one of his classes and so forth. I go into the Uniform Commercial Code, just like I'm doing now. I go into trust law. I talk about accounting and tax law. It looks like I'm jumping around. That's because all this stuff is related. Tax law is related to the Uniform Commercial Code. The Commercial Code is related to trust law, and trust law is related to accounting. All of this stuff comes into play. I just put the link up on the chat. Okay. Anyone's interested. Anybody that's interested in attending the class, go sign up. She, Angela has provided the link. And I'll show you how to get out of all, how to win anything in court, anything. And I'm coming, and it's going to be Tuesday from 5.30 to 8.30 or whatever. Yes, 5.30 to 8.30. Yeah, and it's on, um, I guess you'll, uh, after you send the 25 bucks through the PayPal um, Toby will send you a link and uh, password information to get on the uh, webinar. <laughs> Pops, you just booted me off of the screen. <laughs> oh, man. Don't you love it? Well, you know what? Just go and, to and the your website. Chat, your chat's blocked, too. Just go to the website, myprivateaudio.com. Okay. And then when it opens, on the right there, you'll see the announcement for tonight's call. It says click here, click on that, and that'll open another page that'll show you the uh, links and the PayPal information and the name. It's Toby Dot Butterworth. That's his Skype user ID. And don't give out his phone number, Gene. Last time I guess he got bombarded. Uh, yeah, yeah, hundred hundred phone calls. He told me to tell you not to do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very okay, much, Gene. You. You're Thank welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's go with Nancy. She's been waiting. Go ahead, Nancy. Oh, okay, great. I have some uh, tax questions. You, now, you do. talked about the promissory note, and I have written promissory notes. And Are you a promiss- tax protester? Are Pardon? you in possession of contraband? You mean if they've sent me something and I didn't send it back? Yes, if you didn't assess your tax, you're you're in possession of contraband. And you're a naughty little girl. Wait a minute. You mean if I didn't file a return? Yes, you have to file a return. That's yes. what an assessment is. Yes, but then that's a self-confessed, conf- yeah. No, it's an assessment. That's how you assess the tax. How is yeah. the IRS going to give you a refund unless you report the the credit that these people are using? See, yeah, nobody's do doing I- redemption right. That's why you guys are not winning in court. I don't want to win in court. I want to win. I want to win before I go to court. Well, you can do that too. I've done it out of court. Okay, so this is set, a set. But if I get a bill from them, why aren't they taking my promissory note? Why are you sending them a promissory, promissory note? The bill is a check. Well, how do I get get my money back? Do endorse endorse the bill. Pay to the order of. Department of Treasury, U.S. Yeah. Department of Treasury, Timothy Gunther, Governor of the International Monetary Fund. Right. Thank the you. sum said to the account of Hoover sent you sent you the bill. Do a chargeback. Pay it to the to the IRS. That's the return. Then you do a charge to Hoover sent you the bill. Then you say credit the sum the credit the memory of my account, and then give them your social of the amount. Then put the amount down. So what you're doing is charging it. You're paying it to the IRS. Right. Then they're doing a charge to to the account of the utility company or whoever sent you the bill, and then they credit it to the memory of your account. That's how you do redemption. That's the proper way to do it. I wrote out a I wrote out a check, uh, uh, a bit, uh, international bill of exchange on a napkin, and they gave me a receipt for it. What does that tell you? Thank what? you for your payment. 
I wrote it on a piece of paper, on a, actually on a napkin. I wrote it on a, I drew it on a napkin and wrote it out. Okay, I've, I've seen a lot of people put in prison because of international bills of exchange. Maybe they're doing them wrong. Yeah. What's your first clue? <laughs> that they've been put in prison, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they didn't pay the tax. You can't create debt estimates. All right. If if you are using an international bill of exchange to pay a bill, then what? Well, you're not using it to pay a bill. I take their bill and convert it into a money order. Yeah. That's what the coupon is. Do a pay to the order on the coupon. I Send it to the that. chief financial officer. Say pay to the order of the of the U.S. Department of Treasury, Timothy Gunther. He's the governor of the International Monetary Fund. He's not the secretary. Right. Of- He's not the Secretary of the Treasury. You know who the Secretary of the Treasury is? Jurios. Mendez Torres. Torres, that's it. Puerto Rico. They moved the Treasury, Department of Treasury, to Puerto Rico in 1921. Okay, but I, I have sent, I have gotten coupons, and I have written, you know, a money order to payable to the Department of Treasury. And they have had no effect on any so-called debt the IRS has. You you got a you got a, a bill from who? The IRS. Okay, and what what did you do with the bill? I filled out the coupon, paid to the order of, and sent it back to the IRS. Well, you charged it to the IRS. They're the yeah. ones that are paying you the bill. They're using your account. So you say charge to the IRS instead of your social security number. No, you charge it to the IRS. Whoever sent you the bill is who you charge it to. Okay, so you have it payable to the Department of Treasury, charge to the IRS. And cre- credit the memory of my account number and put your social in there as your account number. Okay. Credit so, the memory? Yeah, credit the memory of your account. All right, so so first you have to file a 1040. Let me ask you, how are you going to pay them when there's no money? With with another debt instrument. Well, the bill is a debt instrument. Yeah. They're sending you, that's really a check. That bill is a check. Well, I've always heard that, but I never figure out how to get any money out of it. Well, I do this all the time. Well, that's wonderful. I want to know how to do that. Okay. You you still got your hand up? Oh, yeah, I, because, all right. So I, I have to file a 1040 first. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you got to file a, a, a 1040 with that and report it as income. Then you do a 1040V, which is a p- payment voucher. Then you fill out the 1096. If you come to my class on Tuesdays, I'll show you all the paperwork and how to fill it out. Wonderful. Is that $25 each Tuesday? Yeah, each Tuesday. Each Tuesday. Okay, so... Um, I'm the I, only one that's teaching this. The well, only one. I, re- I really had have to figure out this IRS stuff because it's just eating me alive, and they have a, a huge levy on my retirement. Yeah, that's why they have a levy on you, because you haven't assessed the tax. All right, so if I did before Tuesday, because I'm sort of in a bind, if I if I do some 1040s and 1040Vs and 1096, I can then learn more on Tuesday to finish this off? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Angela. Okay, see you on Tuesday for sure. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see here. Granny, did you have a question for Jerry? For Jerry, oh my God, for Jean Keating. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question, but you know, maybe it it, it is not a, a proper one. Um, is there anything that you can tell me about uh, a five hundred one c three? Yeah, it's a charitable trust. Well, right. Um, the organization that I belong to, we just lost our 501c3 due to paperwork. Um, is there a way to retrieve it? Yes. 
How do I learn that? <laughs> Come to my class on Tuesday. Okay. Everything is a, is a, is a charitable trust. Yeah. How can you make a profit when there's no money? What do you mean? Well, isn't everything a donation? Yes. I made a mistake. I went to a guy. I went to a guy. Phil Lilly, he's a top gift and estate tax attorney in the United States. I said, "What would be my tax liability if I made a donation to the county?" I had. I didn't tell him I had a mortgage loan. I told him I had a. I made a donation of property to the county. What is my tax liability? He says you can. You can under twenty fifty five. You can deduct the entire amount. It's one hundred percent tax liability. So you're not reporting it as a donation. So you're not getting your deduction. Treat it as a donation. Remember, all all trans monetary transactions are donations. I think I'm lost with what you're talking about. Um, well, the the uh, what is have- your unified tax credit? Go read Publication 950. Okay. You want me to pull it up and read it to you? Well, I don't think a lot of people have an interest in it, but um, when I say due to paperwork, I mean that wasn't filed timely, so they threw the 501c3 out. Okay, the, the, the IRS did? Yeah. I would refile it then. Well, we can, but that's going to cost money. Well, how much does it cost? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't gotten that yet. I just. I was trying to look that up on the IRS site, but I couldn't find it. So I've got to call and see what what it costs. But I think it's quite expensive. Uh, it's several hundred dollars, I believe. Send them a money order. Pardon? Tell them to send you a bill and then do a money order on it. On whose account? Well, if you do a money order, if they send you a bill, just endorse it for payment. So Remember, is- it's a money order. They're using your credit. Okay, but but on who whose credit? Yours. They're sending you a bill. That means they're using your credit. The bill represents the amount of your credit that they're using. Yeah, but I don't have anything to do with it. I'm just an officer of the organization. Well, whoever does it, who's ever doing it, it doesn't have to be you. It doesn't make any difference who it is. Okay. All right. So you're, boy, are you losing me. You're t- saying somebody's individual account. You don't understand that when you get a bill from somebody, I don't care who it is, utility company, gas company, Trash company, dumpster, right? Electric company, IRS. They're using your credit because they're. Why are they using your credit? Because they're all bankrupt. Well, I understand that, but the five hundred one c three has no credit anywhere, right? It's it's n- not. It, it doesn't exist. Well, yeah, but I'm telling you, it doesn't have anything to do with the five hundred one c three. Well, when they then, send you a bill, you said that it was expensive to, to get a, a 501c3. If they send you a bill, you can do a money order on the bill. Endorse it for payment and send it back to them. That constitutes payment. Then you or get whoever your, they send the bill to. Right? To the IRS. No, get, no, I'm saying they might not send her the bill. She's just... Uh, you know, a third party in this whole thing. They will send the bill to the actual person that holds that held the file. Well, who are they sending the bill? To has to do that. Yeah. Who then they have to do it? Yeah, but whoever they're not... sending the bill to is whose credit they're using. They're, they're not right. sending a bill to anybody. I am the treasurer of the organization. Okay. The IRS doesn't send you a bill. No. The IRS didn't send us any paperwork. That's why we didn't get it filed on time. But they don't care. Now they're throwing the 501c3 out. 
and they they threw us into a, a category of a foundation, and then um, they said. Well, re resubmit the. I'm responding to your admonition regarding setting up a 501c3, and you said it was going to be expensive. Have them send you a bill. Or whoever. Whoever is asking you for the 501c3 says, send me a bill. Okay, what if they don't do that? Well, you don't owe them anything if they don't send you a bill. Yeah, do you well, owe anybody anything if they don't make a presentment? Go I read 3 501 You can't they hold wanna... anybody liable unless you make a presentment. In order to charge, if you owe me money, don't I have to make a presentment to you to charge you? But we don't owe them money. We, If we submit an application, we have to submit a fee for the application. Well, if you if you don't owe them money, then tell them to send you a bill with the application. Okay, I think we need to move on. I, I don't think you're understanding, um, but well, they have to send you a bill. If you don't if you make want a five hundred one c three, yes, they're going to send you a bill for it because you've got to pay for it. You said right? Yeah, if they, you, they can't, you don't have to pay for anything unless they send you a bill. You can't send your application in without sending the fee in. Well, how much is the fee? That's what I'm saying. It's several hundred dollars. Well, I tell, them, tell you what amount, the, the amount of the bill. How are you going to send it in if you don't know how much it is? I'm going to call them up and ask them. But you can't send an application without the fee. Okay, fine. Get, get, tell them to send a bill along with the application, and you'll so send the money in when the you return the application. The application is online. The application is what? Online. My question, original question was, is there a way to save the 501c3 that they say they have just canceled? Well, they probably want you to res res resubmit it. You're saying they canceled it because it wasn't filed timely? Right. Well, can you, I don't know that much about 501c3s. We just resubmit it. Tell them to send you a bill along with it, and we'll do a money order. I'll show you how to do a money order. Okay. Okay. All righty. Hey, Jose. Granny. Okay. Huh? <laughs> okay, Jose. <laughs> okay, we have Maggie, Arizona. Hey, Maggie. This is Maggie May. And it's Maggie Hi. May. <laughs> um, I might, I'm going to go down a little different path if it's okay. And I just want Jean's take on something, and I will try to summarize this best I can. I bought a house. It's seller financed. Well, it's a mobile. That's why it's seller financed. And we had a um, the land, the land title company act as account servicer. They went bankrupt and were taken over by Loan Care Account Servicing. So they are the account servicer. I send my payment to them. Then they issue payment to the woman I bought the house from. I was reading my information a little bit since I found out about all this mortgage fraud. Not that I'm accusing the woman I bought the house from, but the account servicer is holding the original promissory note and the original documents. And the strange thing is, is there's a very minimal monthly fee for them to do this. And my question is, what would be their true benefit for a lousy $18 a month to do all the work that they do? Is there something hidden I'm not catching maybe on account servicing? For seller All they're doing is sending you a bill once a month. <clears throat> well, they do more than that in actuality. I mean, they I I send the they have to uh, they they hold impound account for the taxes and insurance 
Um, they have to send late notice if I happen to be late. They have to, you know, I mean, they have to run all the input. The uh, money, the payment actually now goes to a bank lockbox in California that's deposited, then a report is sent daily to the office in Virginia. Okay, so you, they said they charge you $18 a month for that, right? Right. Okay, so you're asking, you want to know what, what their benefit is in doing that? Yeah, beyond, I mean, it doesn't seem to me that their overhead would be covered by the $18 a month for all the trouble that, that they need to go to, in my opinion. Um, you well, know, that's, you're probably right. Uh huh. So, what I'm wondering is um, where would there, because basically, I mean, as far as the, um, like statements, or if I pull up the account activity on my account online through their website, it you know it shows it as a um, original loan amount. It shows the origination date, loan origination date. Um, it does say seller finance, but I noticed on the agreement that we originally signed for them for a account servicing agreement that not only do they hold the original documents on site with them. They don't um, have it, the original documents. Well, that's what they say, and I checked with the seller, and she does not have the original note. We well, both have... Tell me you want to come down and and view the original note. Well, I just sent them... In, I called, and they said they do have it, and I asked for them to send me a current, correct copy with all signatures of all parties that are party to the note. And I'm waiting to receive that back. And I asked them to send that by mail, um, front and back page, you know, front and back of the note. Now, I'll guarantee the, they don't have the note. Hmm. Well, then. We, we They told, uh, Bank 1 and A told me that. I said, good, I'm coming down there and look at it then. When well, I got down there, they didn't have the note. Well, unfortunately, Loan Care is located in Virginia, and I don't have any ability to go from Arizona to there to go to the property and, and check this out. But by the agreement, it states that they are to hold it. It's in the agreement that we signed for the account servicing, which, you know, there was a lot going on in my life back in 2003. I was taking care of an elderly mother, so I was trying to do the best I could to make this deal, um, press for time, and I, I did read and the documents, dummy me. I mean, I was even a realtor at one time. And so, I mean, I feel like I, I let myself down and my mother at the same time, but I'm trying to backtrack. I'm just doing research at this point because I felt that there is something going on behind the scenes with loan care servicing or account servicing for seller financed between a seller and a buyer um, that obviously is benefiting them to more than the tune of eighteen dollars a month. <laughs> it just um, yeah, you're right. Okay, now I have another um, quick question in regards to how I put it. See, um, there was an attorney's firm filed suit on. They first were acting as third-party collector, charged off credit card from 2007. They actually went to the problem to file a civil suit in Kingman against me, representing as attorney for the original bank as a plaintiff. Okay, they filed suit against you for what? For that, for the amount of that charged off credit card. And I did not know how to respond. Ultimately, they received a judgment with obviously no evidence of the debt. And I need to see what I might do to proceed um, in some fashion. I, I really have absolutely no idea what to do because they did receive a judgment from a you know a justice of the peace here in Kingman. It's because you do you went into dishonor. Uh, well, it was it was charged off back in 2007, and they started contacting me in 2009. And I made a feeble attempt to ask them to validate the debt, but I didn't do it with all the, you know, fancy jargon. They never responded except to file a civil suit. 
I responded best I could, and it um, it obviously didn't jive. And the next thing I knew, I I got a judgment sent on me. So at this point, um, what, what are they doing with the judgment? Well, they're threatening, of course, that they can attach and garnish. And I'm on a very limited Social Security income. And at this point, um, do a do a pay point. order to on the judgment. Who issues the judgment? The judge here, the Justice of the Peace in Kingman. Does any of a tax bill? Do a pay to the order of pay to, do, pay it to him. To the justice? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so I take the judgment which has the amount on there that's judge that you know, with the case number. I mean they'd give a total that it's hereby ordered that judgment is entered for this amount. Make it so, make it payable to the Department of the Treasury, but charge it to the judge. <laughs> you want to you want to you want to see you want to you want to see a case go away real fast? <laughs> well, tell me. Is, tell there, me. is there a specific spot on the on that presentment that I am to write these words? I mean, yeah, tell them you'll do a conditional acceptance on proof of claim that they have the authority. Do a. Uh, I wish I had time. I could do a lot. I. Is it, they, they they would cancel that whole thing. Well, yeah, and I under and from what I understand, the attorney actually was acting as third party collector. Collector, you know, he bought the debt. Um, it's Gerstel Shargo, in case you're familiar with that firm. And um, they're actually atta- attacking a friend of mine down in Mesa under the same guise, and she's just in the beginning stages with the, with the first contact from them. So I thought, well, maybe in view of what happened to me. Um, I can help her not get into the same position because now we're both a little more educated. You need to learn how to write a letter. I've written seven letters, and every time I write a letter, I never hear from them again. Well, I know, but, you know, you've been been doing this for as long as I've been alive. So, (laughs) you, I mean, I will give you all the credit in the world and admiration for your intelligence, and I know I can't learn the whole the whole legal system in one in one phone call. But if I know it, maybe how to even just start an, um, a rebuttal against this or even some kind of a claim against the damn attorney for acting as third-party collector and as attorney for the plaintiff. It's probably I mean, the attorney that's bringing the claim. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, even though he named Merrick Bank, um, he's doing as an assignee or having bought the bought it from Merrick Bank. Because Merrick Bank, actually, when I gave them a valid, my my feeble attempt at a validation of the debt letter, they actually ceased and desist, and they sent me so much as an information about that, but that they were going to put it out to their legal team. Did you say this wide. was? Did you say this was a credit card debt? Uh huh. You know who owns both sides of the credit card? Me. No, the was, DTC. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. The the what? The DTC, as in uh, the Depository the, Trust Corporation, okay. or Depository Trust Company. See? Right. All right. Well, um, possibly I can I can scrape up some money to to get in on one a few of your Tuesday classes. I'll show you how to do an unconditional acceptance, and they'll they'll go away. Unconditional. No, conditional. Oh, a conditional acceptance. Okay. Got to do a letter and they'll disappear. Even regarding the fact that they've already got a judgment even. Okay. Yeah, he'll he'll be able to cancel the whole thing. Okay. All right. If I can make a $60,000 judgment go away with a letter, I can make that go away. I'll okay. guarantee you, you didn't do a $60,000 credit card. No, no. In fact, it's you know it's on, it's like two grand. That's it. And um, never in my life in history did I did I realize that. I mean, I've never heard of anybody going after anybody for for those charged off credit cards. I mean, that's been going on through history. And, well, that's because you know, they get away with it. I write them one letter, and they never I never hear from them again. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go on and we'll let other people talk. I just I wanted to get your take on it and. Um, um, I will, 
I will try to maybe get in contact with you if you have a few minutes on the, you know, on a personal level where maybe I can just pick your brain just on a few things or you can put me into a template of some sort or a basic letter that I could get started with. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jean, and thank you, Angela. Nice talking to you. Thanks, Maggie, for coming on the call. You can mute me back out. (laughs) Okay. Thank you. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, moving on. Jeff, go ahead. Jeff Coram Nobis. Hi, Gina. I was, as you were speaking, I had a couple of more fundamental questions I was hoping you might answer for me. Would Would you say that a cross claim and a counter claim are one and the same? Yeah, they're pretty. Yeah, they're pretty close. Okay. In uh, Patrick's information uh, that I, that I think he's probably gotten most of from you. He says it is absolutely mandatory to do one of these cross claims, and he ties it back into biblical stuff. And yeah. I just thought that was interesting. That's how you identify yourself as a creditor. That's what he said. He said it, well, see, here's how I see it, Gene. In the Bible, in the Bible, that Christ went into the temple and he turned the tables on the money changers. And I think that's what all this has to do with. That's what um, the over is. And that's what turning the tables was, was was switching the the switching it around so that you're now the plaintiff instead of the 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 um help me. You know why tax returns are filed on April fourteenth? Why? Because that's the Passover. Uh, yes, okay, I understand that. Okay, the Passover is from April fourteenth to the twenty second. The the other thing I'd like to ask you if you agree with this is is in the in the scripture the Christ when they asked him if he if the master paid tribute he told the disciple to tell him to go get it out of the fish's mouth. Now in my opinion, I think that has to do with the cusip number and the call. I think this is all related somehow because I think what he's talking about there is what you have said on this call. When you go get the money out of the fish's mouth, where does the fish live? The fish lives in the admiralty, in the pool. In the sea. Yeah, when you go to the great big pooling account and you go fish for the... That's what they call the beast that came in and out of the sea. Yeah, and so what you're trying to do is bring that fish back up onto the dry land, aren't you? Yeah, you know what the word beast stands for? Go ahead. Belgium Electronic Surveillance Terminal. Huh. Belgium Electronic Automated Surveillance Terminal. Yeah, and, and what you're doing What's is... What's that? That's, an, that's ANA, Annual Numerical Number Association in Brussels, Belgium, which is tried into the BIS, Bank of International Settlements. Yes. And that's where these CUSIP numbers are on. And I had a friend who just got a CUSIP number on his case here in Indianapolis. He went from 30 years to uh, three years probation because we there were some things we didn't understand. But it don't matter when they tell you when they tell you 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 go fish that call. They tell you you have a right to one phone call. That one phone call is not talking about a phone call, is it, Gene? It's talking about going in and getting that bond. It's got, and you have to have the CUSIP number to identify the bond. And as soon as you identify the CUSIP number, you can go fish and bring the, the the fish back from the sea onto the dry land where you can deal with it. Am I correct? Well, they're using the 141 of, of Title 26, private debt instrument. Yeah, and then once you get it up on dry land, then now you can deal with it, you know. And, yeah, but you got to make them pay the tax. They don't have a bond. No, you you have to give them a 1099A or B or C. I don't know which one. Well, you got to do an OID because they don't have a bond on it. They're using you as the as the original issue discount. Well, they're That's trying why they put you in prison. Yeah, they're trying to use your exemption. Well, your exclusion, why, yeah. Yeah, and you and that's why you have to turn the tables on them. And one of these forms turns the tables on them, but I'm not sure exactly which one. Do a margin call. You know what a margin call is? Uh, no, no, I'm not. For, I'm not familiar with that, sir. Okay, when you buy, when you trade on the on the on the uh, 
uh, on the commodity exchange, you do, there's, they're called puts and calls. A put is a buy and a call is a, is a sell. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, and they buy things on margin. Right. Which means that the the, the trader will give them fifty fifty percent credit. Uh huh. And if they go over that credit, he does a call margin call on them, which means they have to come up with the rest of the money, which is why they make you put a bond up. Right. What you're doing is indemnifying their claim, but they have a tax claim because they haven't registered the security, so there's no bond in place. So go read 2032E11. They have to put a bond up with the Secretary of Treasury's office to cover the capital transfer tax, which right. they haven't so, paid. So when you make your one phone call, which actually really means is you're going back to the market and telling them to call the security back in, are you not? Right. That means they have to put the funds up. Yeah. And they have to release you. They're holding you as the collateral for the funds. That's right. And they're, and they're actually using your exemption or what, whatever you called it. Exclusion. They're using your exclusion, which is your Social Security number. They're using that in order to keep you in bondage, are they not? Yeah, they're using that to cover the margin. Right. And when you call, if you do a margin call, they have to come up with the funds, and they can't do that. Either they have to do that or release you. Yes, so if you don't if you don't make the call, if you don't if you ask not, you get not, or however that expression goes, you have to ask. Uh, you, you wanna to, you wanna you want them to file a ten ninety nine OID to identify who the payor is on the funds and who the recipient of the funds is. Tell them okay. that. You yes. wanna see how fast they get you they get you out of there? Right, because the recipient on the funds would have to be you. Yeah. Because you're the bank, and 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 everything has to come back through you, through the source. Well, no, you're not the recipient. You're the payor. Well, you would would you not actually be the payor and the recipient? Well, they're the recipient of the funds. That's why they have the tax liability. They're the transferee. Oh, you're right. Okay, that's exactly right. You're right. So this would keep you from doing any kind of an argument, any kind of it, it would keep you from doing any kind of filings into that court. You're not going to tell them you're not doing anything until they they prove prove up their claim. That's a margin call. Yeah. You ask them to produce the 1099 OID. You're doing a margin call. Yes. And, because and that, they have to identify where the source of the funds are, and if they're not the source of the funds, they have to release you. Right, and and if they yeah, if they don't do it, either way, they have to release you because one way that that's one one way you you basically you've made an offer to settle the claim and they've refused it, which means a debt tendered and refused as a debt paid. And if they either way, they have to release you because one way you've made the offer to to settle the claim, and the other way they refused your offer, so a debt tendered and refuses a debt paid. They they have to let you out one way or the other, do they not? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Very good. You answered my question. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, next we have Hi Beautiful Five. That's a lovely name. <laughs> Give me five. Hello? Without no Hello? job. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. How you doing? Um, well, we're doing pretty good. Um, I have a, a question on uh, um, uh, close the, writing a letter, um, writing on a closed checking account. Yeah. You have to do an electronic transfer if you do it on a closed account. Yes, that's what we did was an um, a electronic transfer. And we bought, um, actually we paid off a mortgage for our son, and the mortgage was paid off, and he is all worried that something's going to happen, that it's going to come back on him, or he's going to have issues with it. Well, you got to understand what you're, do- you got to know what you're doing. I did that with Walmart. I did a closed count check, and he said the check was bad. I said, well, give me the check back. It wouldn't give me the check back, so I just gave him another one. And the guy, I did a bill of exchange, and the guy, uh, the, their legal department called me up. 
He says, how can we settle this? And I said, well, I gave you the bill of exchange. Just settle and close the account. I'm authorizing you to settle and close the account. He says, okay. So he did. Okay, well, the mortgage uh, company sent them a $4,400 check for that was what was rem the remainder in their escrow account and said that the uh, account had been paid or the loan had been paid off. Yeah, well, that's there's your proof. Okay. He's got nothing to worry about unless they want to double dip. Right. If they if they come back, sometimes they'll do that. They'll double dip, and you think you're in – what they're doing is they're double dipping. They're making okay. another charge to your account. They figure, well, if they can get one payment out of you, they can get another one. Right. <laughs> now, um, can they come – they can't come back on us either, can they? Well, these people do whatever they want. It's a free-for-all. Right. And on the back, when we endorse it, we put on there, um, not for deposit, EFT only for discharge of debt. Yeah. Uh, find it authorized representative, and it's without recourse. And when you, uh, if you don't put that down there, they'll try to double dip. Right. They try to go in there, and they try to deposit it. And then the check will bounce. Right. You can't deposit an electronic transfer check. Right. We've had a few cases where that happens, where they try to deposit it, and they go, well, it, it bounced. And they go, well, it's an EFT. And they act like they don't know what it is. Now I'm to read Title 15, Section 7001 through 7006. That's the Uniform Electronic Transfer Act and the Uniform Electronic Signature Act. Okay, title. is that Title 15? Title 15, yeah. 7, it's in 1-108 1 1. of the Uniform Commercial Code. That's why they created MIRS, the Mortgage Electronic Registration System. They do an right. electronic transfer. And electronic transfer uh, on a non-negotiable, that's why all these, all these loans are non-negotiable instruments. That's right. why the Uniform Electronic Transfer Act controls because it's it's not governed by Article 3. If it's a negotiable instrument, it's governed by Article 3 and not the UETA. Okay. Now, how would we uh, enforce that if they don't accept it? Well, just... Uh, uh, you mean if they send you the check back? Yes. You mean for they make another presentment? So uh, this is on another case. Well, do a do a conditional acceptance on proof of claim. Where do they get the authority to make another presentment? Do a conditional uh -huh. acceptance on proof of claim. Oh, make them they prove up their a... make them prove up their authority to make another presentment when you've already discharged the existing one. That's how you use conditional acceptance to get rid of your, your liability. And people are not doing that. Okay. Um, do you have an example of a conditional acceptance? You betcha. Them. Okay. They go, sign up for my class on Tuesday nights. I we, go into we, that we, in detail. We, we signed up for it, but because we're not real good at... Uh, um, all the PayPal account, and we we kind of screwed it all up. So we're gonna get we're gonna try for next Tuesday. Okay. Okay. Now, what about places that say they don't accept the EFTs? They do. Yeah, Who says they don't that? accept it? Pardon me. The U, U, UETA has been put into every every the Uniform Commercial Code one dash one hundred eight. Time to go read the Uniform Commercial Code. Okay. Go read one dash one hundred eight. Okay, we'll do that. And go read the Title Fifteen Section seven thousand one through seven thousand six. Okay, we haven't read that, but I've I've gone through a lot of the UCC stuff. Read those two sections. Okay. We'll do that.
Uh, thank you very much. You answered all our questions. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move along here. We have um, Cleveland has a question. Go ahead, Cleveland. Um, Hello? There, yeah, hi. Yeah, how you doing? Fine, thank you. Did you have a question for Gene Keating? Yeah, um, Gene, you mentioned um, when you were on a, a, a talk show, I think a week or two ago, about using a, a constructive trust along with the executor letter. And um, I was wondering, can you go into that a little bit about uh, how you put the constructive trust together, how it's worded, or if you have an example of that on your Tuesday class, or can you get into that a little bit? Okay, a constructive trust is what equity, a court of equity uses to give restitution and reimbursement to a plaintiff when they're in, in, in illegal, and you can do one. Okay. I have a, a complaint that was done by Jessica McCarran. It's a RICO complaint. She put a constructive trust into the complaint to give restitution and reimbursement to the to the plaintiff who she was representing. That's how a court of equity gives restitution to a plaintiff when the person they're doing the constructive trust against is in possession of money that they're not entitled to. That's why you do that's how you get restitution and reimbursement. That's what that's what the purpose and function of a constructive trust is. Every time you go into court and they're bringing a claim against you and there's another plaintiff involved, they're using a constructive trust in, in equity. Okay. So what I do is I point the judge as a trustee and I make him liable for all the taxes and they drop the case. So when you appoint the judge as a as a trustee, that's part of the constructive trust. Right, and you have the power of appointment under the Power of Appointment Act of 1951 because you're the donor. And the donor has that, because it's a Class 5 gift and estate tax, the donor has con total control over the power of appointment. You can appoint anybody. Hmm. And they have to accept that. Hmm. Read 2038 and 2514 of the Title 26. That's the Power of Appointment Act under Title 26. It was passed in 1951. Hmm. So you, and, and, and uh, from your purview, using the constructive trust as enforcement, that would work with the executive letter. If yes, it would. If cases where judges just gloss over and keep moving on. That's what, that's what David Clarence has missing from his executive letter. Mm-hmm. You have the power of appointment. You can appoint anybody. You're the holder of the power of appointment. Why? Because everything is a class five gift and estate tax, and the donor controls it all. Okay. It, can that can that constructive trust also work? Um, you were saying on a previous call that. You were, uh, I guess you were in an eviction, you, you went and claimed the property. Was that property in an eviction situation? Or you said you went in and you claimed the property? Yeah, well, the people deeded me the, what they did is they, they deeded me the, the, uh, the they gave me a, a grant deed. They, they abandoned the property. They left the house. Okay. They gave it to me. So I defended it. I've still got it. This is three years ago. I've had it for three years. <laughs> but what they, they they tried to do a. Uh, they tried to do an unlawful detainer. Right, they tried to do everything. Right. I, I clotheslined them. Now when they when they put the unlawful detainer in, that's when you uh, 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 did you do a conditional acceptance or you uh, or uh, the constructive trust. I did a, yeah, I did a constructive trust, and I did affirmative defenses. They didn't have the authority to conduct a sale. Did you know that 50% that of the owners of the of the notes have to certify before they, before they can do a substitution of trustee? Hmm. Under 29, go read 2934 of the California Civil Code. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, the... Uh, 
the letter that you read on the previous call uh, with with David. Um, yeah, Todd, I wrote that for it's a sixty thousand dollar car loan. The but judge took the case off the calendar. You mentioned some. Yeah, I, I remember you were saying that. You mentioned you also mentioned some Ohio law in that in that case. Well, it was all California. Mm-hmm. 3305, which is uh, 3301, 3303, and 3309. You have to be a holder. They don't have. They're not a holder. They're not a holder in due course because the the, the note is a non-negotiable instrument. Okay. So they took it subject to all your defenses and claims. So if I do defenses and claims, what are they going to do? Right. They can't foreclose on the property. Hmm. Three years, huh? Yeah, I still got it. I'll, I'll have it three years from now. Hmm. You know what happens when a paper asshole meets a blowtorch? A what? <laughs> this, this family show, Gene. Okay, excuse, excuse my French. You get spontaneous combustion. Right. Right. What well, I'd like to see that. Um, are you going to present that Tuesday? Like yeah. An example of that. Okay. Remind him. You got to bring it, bring it up. Just remind me, and I'll go into it. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. So write it down so we can remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, is there anything that you um, do? You see the executive letter as being a. a, a with your with your knowledge in the areas of expertise with trust law, and um, I think the office is vacant. I think the donor has the power of appointment. Go point yourself the executor. Okay. Tell you under under twenty thirty eight and twenty five fourteen of Title twenty six, I'm uh, appointing myself the special occupant of the legal estate of the decedent by absolute. It's called absolute estate. Absolute estate. You said 20, 20 what? 2038 and 2514 of Title 26. 25, okay. As the donor beneficiary of this trust, or you can, you can call it a constructive trust if you want. I'm, a, I'm appointing myself, I'm filling the office of the special, I'm claiming the office of the special occupant of the legal estate. Say it's a legal estate. It's not a legal estate because there's no executor. You know what happens when when when, it, when you know what an intestate is? When when, it, when an estate has no heir or beneficiary, that's why these judges are doing constructive trust and equity, right? And giving restitution and reimbursement to the plaintiff, which is the lender or the okay. servicing company. It's because there's no beneficiary or heir. You are the heir and beneficiary to the estate, and you're not stepping up to the to the plate, and you're striking out. Hmm. That's why you're not winning in court. Right. They took me out of their system. I'm not even in their system now. So you, do you know how to, um, uh, once you establish a trust, there's no need in going after their bonds as enforcement? No, that's a waste of time. Make them liable for the tax. Oh, right, right. Fantastic. Taxable termination. I'm appointing myself the donor as the executor of the estate. And I'm making you the trustee by power of appointment of the Power of Appointment Act of 1951. What are they going to say? And because you're the occupant of the executor office. Right. I'm occupying. I'm right. claiming the executive office of the legal estate of the decedent. Right. That's what's right. missing on, on David's uh, uh, letter. Because you cannot make that appointment as the grantor, can you? No, you have to do it as the donor. Yeah. Right. Right. Because the donor has – I looked this up. I've got the – I'll go into that in my, in my class, yes. show you the authority for it. Right. You've got total power, right. and you're not using it. Well, I like the fact that you bring in Title 26, um, uh, uh, 2514, and Title 26, and the other, I think it was 20... 38. 2038. 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna study that. But you know, you, you you're bringing in. Uh, I have the original laws, the original statutes, which say pass those. Public law. Okay. They passed that in 1951. Now, when you um um, if you What's your stance on the general post? Is it, if if the general post is being ignored, I mean, I know we're sending in letters to the uh, uh, the postmaster general, the postal inspector, but if the general post is being ignored, do you use the general post with your executor letter process or? Um, yeah, I would. Okay. Okay. Spank them and send them home without any porridge. Absolutely. Bravo. you got to show them who's lost. <laughs> right. You know what the bottom line is? If you don't know what your rights are, you don't have any. And you know what rights are under the Uniform Commercial Code 1-201? Rights or remedies. If you don't know your remedy, you don't have any. That's why... The, that's why most people are not winning in court when they go into court. Mm. And when you go in, remember, when you go into, and when it involves real property, you have to be in a land court. None of these courts are land courts. Challenge subject matter jurisdiction. If the real party and interest isn't before the court, can the court make a ruling? Are you saying that if most foreclosures are in the wrong venue because it's not a land court? What's your first clue? Venue. You're in an improper venue, and you're getting you know where they're getting subject matter jurisdiction by contract, because you're contracting with them. Go in there by say I'm here by special uh, appearance on proof of claim. I'll conditionally accept your offer to move forward on this case on proof that this is a court of record and that and that you, this is a land court that has jurisdiction and venue under the Constitution to litigate land cases, which is what a foreclosure case is. None of these courts, and I'm not talking about an N-U-N, I'm talking about an N-O-N-E. None of these courts have jurisdiction to foreclose on anybody's property. They're doing it by contract because you're going in there waiving jurisdiction. You can't waive subject matter, but you're not raising subject matter jurisdiction. I've got all the documentation on this. Hmm. You know who Donna Baran is? I spent a whole two hours on the phone with her this morning. There's a and if you if you you sign up for my class I'll give you a copy of this you ought to read this letter Here, here's here's I'll, I'll tell you what it says okay you can't get they took this off the internet because of the impact it's going to have and this is in thirty four this is volume thirty four uh, let me get, g- give you the site okay. on this I'll give I gave a copy of this to to Angela today I don't know if she read it. I'm ready. Well, she, she can give it out. Anybody that wants a copy of it, I'll give you a copy of it. It says abolishing local action rules. First step toward modernizing, modern, modern, modernizing jurisdiction and venue in Tennessee. These people don't have venue to foreclose on anybody's property because they're not land courts. And this documents the whole thing. I've got all the cases. I pulled every case in this, and there's about 100 cases in here. This is 60 pages long. Hmm. This is a law review. Donna Verone. For all the people, uh, Gene, uh, that have... And here's here's another. Let me, let me, let me say this. Uh, excuse me for interrupting you. Oh, but... excuse me. Okay, let me let me uh, give you this case site. You can pull this off. This is on the internet. Ponzi P O N Z I versus Fessenden F E S S E N D E N. And the and the site is spell that spell that again, Gene. Slower. 
is Frank, mm-hmm. Echo, Sam, Sam, Echo, November, Delta, Echo, November. Ascendant. Okay. And it's 258 U.S. 254. You can download it off the Internet, but I've got the annotated. It says a court mm-hmm. has dual jurisdiction, two jurisdictions. Let me let me read this to you. I'll read to you this right out of the case. I'll quote it to you right out of the case. We live in the jurisdiction of two sovereignties, each having its own system of courts to declare and enforces laws in common territory. It would be impossible for such courts to fulfill their respective functions without embarrassing conflict unless rules were adopted by them to avoid it. The people for whose benefit these two systems are maintained are deeply interested that each system shall be effective and uninhibited in its vindication of its laws. The situation requires, therefore, not only definite rules fixing the powers of the courts in cases of jurisdiction over the same persons and things in actual litigation, but also a spirit of of reciprocal commodity and mutual assistance to promote promote due and orderly procedure. You have a dual jurisdiction. Hmm. Listen, listen to this. The chief rule which preserves our two systems of courts from actual conflict of jurisdiction is that the court which first takes subject matter of the litigation into its control, whether this be person or property, must be permitted to exhaust its remedy to attain which is which it, it assumed control before the other court shall attempt to take it for its purpose. The principle is stated by Mr. Justice Matthews in Covell versus Heyman, 111 U.S. And I pulled that case. I pulled every case in this case. Hmm. So... Whichever court, even if the court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction, if they take control of it by you contracting with them, they have to exhaust that litigation. But if you challenge subject matter jurisdiction, then they have to prove it. Hmm. A land court, and in Florida, it's the county court. So, and in, in, uh, since you know you know about Ohio, and and uh, and this all, area, every every state constitution has this in it. Most okay. of them have a county court. Okay. Which has it's called a land court. And they have only the land court has venue over the foreclosure. None of these courts that are foreclosing on these properties has venue. And nobody's challenging venue. When 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 you say county courts, you mean like um for example, Cuyahoga County, because I know you know Cleveland. Cuyahoga County, wouldn't that be the court? I believe area. it's the the uh, court of common pleas. Right, right. Well, they're, they're, well, they're doing it right here because that's the court that they foreclose in the court of common pleas. Yeah, but is that a is that a county court? Yeah. Go look at your constitution. I haven't read Ohio's constitution. Ask them if they have jurisdiction over land. Okay. Where does it say it in the cost? Go look in your constitution and see where it's, the jurisdiction is conferred on them to do to, to do foreclosures. 
Hmm. Challenge venue, not jurisdiction. Venue. Venue. Now, if that's the case, if, if, if someone has lost their home, they can go right back in there you, uh, on these same issues, can't they? Yeah, you bet your bippy. Okay. You can get a void judgment. You want a void judgment? It's void on their face because the court lacks subject matter jurisdiction. In California, that's 473D of the California Civil Code. And we can shepherdize it into Ohio. Yeah, see, California, because of the population, they have a, a separate civil code, and they have a code of civil procedure. And I know every section in it. Hmm. Yeah, I hear California is really... They're getting away with murder because people don't read the statutes. Mm-hmm. And they're not challenging venue. They're going in there and contracting with people. <laughs> Go in there and contract with them. Don't contract with them. Right. That's how they get jurisdiction. And this is what this is telling you. Right. They do it by consent. Right. They can't. They, they, the judge tries to get you to consent. Right. What are you even, doing when you testify? If you return the papers within the 72 hours, because, you know, there's times when they don't get a service, for example, and they'll still try to proceed and get a judgment without even getting service. Yeah, but th- because we have a t- they can't do that if you challenge oh. venue. They don't have venue. Okay. No, but I don't know anybody that's raised venue. Hmm. I hear the jurisdiction thing, but, you know, you, you're coming in with venue, you know. Venue is more important than jurisdiction. Hmm. That's probably, I'm going to check the Ohio Constitution. Yeah, it's because it, it'll tell you what. Uh... And we're definitely going to have it this Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, Toby, uh, I'll be ready. Yeah. Let me go into the etymology dictionary. Okay. When you look up words, you should go into the Etymology Dictionary and look up the definition. I'm going to look up the word venue. Okay. And read it to you, what it says. Uno momento, por favor. Okay, Cleveland, give us a little song and uh, a little music, maybe. <laughs> Start singing. <sighs> How's your hey, voice here's tonight? Menu. <laughs> oh, you finally. Know, come to Cleveland. <laughs> okay. Venue. Venue. Early 14th century, a coming for the purpose of attack. From old French venue, coming. From the fe- feminine... Passive participle of veneer to come from Mary to come from the PIE base GWA to go or come from. See come, the sense of place where a case in law is tried is first recorded in the 1530s, extended to locality in general, especially site of a concert or sporting event. A change of venue is from Blackstone, and it uses the word C-O-M-E, which I hear. It's, it, so C-O-M-E means to approach land. What does that tell you? Hmm. To come, approach land, come to oneself, recover, arrive, assemble. 
to go from, to come. He goes to be born. Substitution of, of O for you is, is scribal change before minimums. Originally, M-U-N, Manuk, some modern past tense from came is Middle English, probably from the old noun. Really productive with, with, uh, verbs. Got a lot of background noise going on, a lot of air. You in front of a fan, Cleveland? Yes, I'm here. Are you in front of a fan? No, I had you on speaker. I, I was. Oh. Is that a little better? Yeah. It, mean, it means background noise. Land. Do you see how important this is? See, venue means land, and they can only only a court that has venue over land has jurisdiction. Hmm. Nobody, I don't know any. You know anybody that's ever raised venue? Well, I would say, uh, Angela, doesn't uh, Harold in New York, I mean, I haven't talked in a long, long time, doesn't he bring up the issue of venue? Yeah. Yeah. I think I mentioned Harold to you, Gene. I hope you guys ought to get together and talk. Yeah, I like to talk to him. <laughs> Not like a smart man. Yeah, he is. Yeah, that's uh, venue is very important. They don't have venue, hmm. and you're giving it to them by consent. You're consenting to it, even though they don't have it. You're giving it to them. Hmm. And I know you mentioned earlier how you go in. Um, you don't go in, you know, waiving any of your rights, and um, you go in a special appearance. Yeah. Right I don't front. consent. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. It works, too. Hmm. You have to stand your ground. Right. Okay, anything else, Cleveland? No, I I I um uh, I'm just going to uh listen in and and uh I'll see you Tuesday, Jane. Okay. And I appreciate the call. You're welcome. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, we've got a few more uh California. Go ahead, California. I guess that's me, right? That's you. Oh, hi, Dallas. Hi, how are you, Angela? Fine, um, thank you. I uh, yeah, thank you for having Gene Keating on, by the way. My pleasure. Uh, Gene, I uh, I have a couple of questions, but I actually have a DVD of you from a couple of years ago that I've looked at a couple of times, and I haven't looked at it in the past year, but um, it was a seminar that you did where. Uh, the same thing I heard back then is the same thing I'm hearing now. So it's it's telling me that you know what you're saying is accurate, and uh, and that's something I appreciate. Uh, my question is regarding the 8281 form. Um, uh, me and a friend are helping uh, someone else that kind of got in trouble. Uh, they listened to someone um, using a 1099 OID and. Uh, got a fairly decent check, um, kind of under a little bit under $200,000. Ended up paying a bunch of bills, getting things done, and then the IRS came back after him. And so he's been through... They want to find out if you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's been through U.S. District Court. He's down in San Diego. Been through U.S. District Court already. Uh, they uh, And what they want to do is they want him to... Uh, they're attempting to enforce uh, the summons on him to, you know, his books and records and everything. And uh, and so what he's doing now is he's doing an appeal. But I was looking at the form 8281 in regards to Part 2. File 494. Ask them where their, where their claim is. 
And what was that again? 4490, proof of claim. Oh, so the proof of claim. Yeah, make them prove their claim. The IRS. Okay. Now, would he would he need to do an 8281 since he did a 1099 OID? Well, I'd make them uh, prove up their claim. Okay. Even though you didn't file the 8281. Okay. So proof of claim. Okay, and that, that's the IRS form 4490. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, because they, what they're attempting to do right now is to do coercive uh, tactics to get him in prison because he's doing an appeal, and everything we've done so far is based in pure law. And so they've made tremendous amount of errors. I mean, all kinds of errors. They just, I can't believe they're that stupid. But, um, and everything they put on paper. And, um, yeah, they're, they're, well, maybe they're not stupid. They They know what they're doing. They are just rolling over him. They just don't care. They don't. They don't even read anything that he submitted, and uh, um, and they just they ju- are just rolling over him. They just don't care. They're the judges writing orders that you know just the way the uh, attorney is the U.S. attorney is telling them to write, and uh, and so uh, yeah. So this proof of claim is the one that uh, should be sent what directly to the Internal Revenue Service. Yeah. Is it is the address to send it to on the forty four ninety? I believe it is, yeah. Okay, so it'll be sent to that address, not to the court or to the U.S. attorney then? Yeah. Okay. Um, you okay. can give a copy of it to the U.S. attorney. Okay, so they can get a copy of that, Dwight. Okay. And uh, so his, uh, him doing 8281 is not at issue right now then? They're just that proof of claim? Yeah, to make them prove up their claim. Where do they got a claim to, uh, to uh, invalidate his 1099 OID? Okay. Go oh, look at the 4490. Re- read it. Okay. It. Okay. And and uh, is there is there a publication for the 4490 that uh, explains a lot of it? Yeah, I believe there is. Uh, well, I guess if I were to Google that up, it would probably come up with the uh, the publication then that, that would talk about that. Yeah, hang, it might be on the forum. Hang, hang on a minute. I'll I'll pull it up here. Hang on, just take me a minute to pull this up. My computer is faster than a speeding bullet. It's able to leak things that are single bound. I thought you had a rodent and a wheel operating the thing earlier. Well, my hamster died, so I had to replace it. Hmm. He had a Marty or he had a, a mild cardiovascular malfunction. <laughs> <clears throat> or a thing driving it to the bone. Yeah, it's it's uh form four forty four ninety proof of claim for internal revenue taxes. It says the undersigned officer of the Internal Revenue Ser- Service, a duly authorized agent of the United States, in this behalf being duly sworn disposes and said he has to put his name here, is justly and truly debted to the United States in the amount of, with interest and penalty showing. Okay, yeah, I'm attempting to pull that one up too, but my, my computer must be just like yours. So I'm having a hard time pulling it up. Okay. okay they, I see it right now, yes, I see it. Okay, yeah, there's a... a It says, use, now this is in the Internal Revenue Manual 5.5.4, Proof of Claim Procedures. So here's the practice manual on it. It says, use Form 4490, Proof of Claim for Internal Revenue tax, Taxes when filing a claim in probate or non-bankruptcy and solvency pre, pre, proceedings. Now, you know, just like you talked about earlier, um, they did file a, a notice of federal tax lien against them, and it was on the kind of tax, I see it here, the kind of tax in period, uh, 1040, just Section 1040 for the estate tax. And I, I'm familiar with what you're talking about under uh, Document 6209 for the uh, tax class 5 uh, type of taxes, estate and gift tax. Yeah, it's a um, tax on farm property. Right, and, and I didn't know that about what the definition of farm was until you explained that. Now that makes sense to me. 
Now it's it's an alternate value valuation on a decedent's estate. Right under under 2032A valuation. Yes, and, it's uh, a valuation on a carryover basis. Yes, and you know what? The one thing I mentioned too that I, that I that we're doing this, I know because it's happened to me before, and um, and I know I pulled up a uh, um, a privacy act transcript, and in the transcript it actually shows that in there that uh, they designate it as the uh, executor, and shows the uh, carryover basis in there. Yeah, point them the executor. Yes. Uh, so, and that's what they did for him. So, I guess that kind of tax on uh, on this form 4490 would be the 1040 do, do tax. Do send him a letter yeah. telling him that under 2038 and 2514, under the Power of Appointment Act of 1951, you're appointing them as the executor of the estate of the decedent. Now they have to pay all the taxes under. So you mean as executor or, or as a. Uh, yeah, appoint, appoint as, him as the executor of the estate. Oh, well, appoint them as executor, not him. He wouldn't be the executor. Yeah, appoint the IRS agent is coming after you as the executor. Okay. Okay. Because whoever is the executor has to pay the tax, right, Gene? Right. Yeah. Go read oh. two thousand two. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so you appoint the executor. It's known as executor. IRS. Um, I mean, would you even want to appoint the judge as executor? Yeah, you could appoint the judge. Appoint the judge. Say, I'm making you the executor. I had to run out of the courtroom. Well, well you know what? They just when you said that running out of the courtroom back about eleven years ago, I, I, um, I when the redemption process started uh, with Roger Elvick and Ron Lutz and Rice McCloud and those guys, I was in their trainings, and I was the first one in, in Southern California to go into court, and in LA County, and uh, to do all of that stuff. I got arrested in there, but when. Uh, uh, it was in Riverside County, and when I went to LA County and I did that, and I accepted for value what the um, judge said, I didn't know why he ran out of court, but he got up and ran out. And now I know why he ran out from what you're explaining. And you know, he, I guess he didn't know that I didn't know what, what I was doing. I just said I accepted for value. It was an audio recording of a court of record, and he actually got up and ran out and pointed to certain people to meet him in the chambers. And didn't go, go read until, this. This, this is an actual manual. I've got it open here. Is that, is that the Internal Revenue Manual? Yeah, it's 5.4. 5. Uh, 5. 5. 5. 5.4? 5.1. 0.1, okay. 5.5.4.1. 5. 5. 5.4.1, 5. 5. uh, section overview. Yeah, it says collecting. Claim procedures. Yeah, and it talks about uh, Form 10492, Notice of Federal Taxes Due. Ah, Okay. Under 31 U.S.C. 3713. Now, let me ask you a question here, okay? For his case, I could see where that could be something that could work very well. Um, um, I have a case right now. I don't have a driver license. I and I. This is in Long Beach, right here in California, and I've been back and forth to the court, and uh, and I don't want to. You know, I'm not stipulating for commission. I want to go into a court of record with the judge. But the commissioner hasn't been there. It's been pro tems, and they just don't know what to do. They're just attorneys that are just there temporarily. And um, but um, would going into the court with a judge in a court of record and appointing the judge, uh, what would that do? In a uh, you could do that orally. In a yeah, in you a need to download the Uniform Trust Code of 2005, Section 406 and 407. Tell you how to do an oral appointment. You can form a trust orally, so that I can I can appoint the judge there, as fiduciary or, or as executive or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and this is just a traffic ticket case because I don't have a driver license, and it's a misdemeanor case. Well, say you're you're at, you have the power of appointment under the Power of Appointment Act of 1951, under sections 2038 and 2514 of Title 26. As the donor and beneficiary of record, you're appointing the judge as the executor of the legal estate of the decedent. You know, and I didn't know until you mentioned that, that that's why 11 years ago when I did that in L.A. Oh, Ask that, him if he's got a strategy. That, that the judge ran out because he thought I was going to appoint him. Yeah. You have to pay the tax. Because what he did was he told me, he said, if you, if you walk out of my courtroom, I'm going to have you remanded to custody and I'm going to put 50000 a bill on you. So I accepted it for value. And he got up and ran out. And maybe I guess he thought he was going to have to pay tax on the fifty thousand. Well, yeah, because you 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 you. Counter- I guess, 
Like counter- I can right now before I, I had the chance to appoint him. Yeah, on, uh, say on proof of claim. Say uh, I, I, I'll conditionally uh, offer to post $50,000 on proof of claim. If yeah. you have the authority to make a presentment. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and Gene, I, when I saw your DVD, I looked at it. I, it was, uh, I guess, the most... Um, the most uh, precise explanation of the commercial process I'd, I've heard in you know since uh, 1999, and uh, I hunted you down. I couldn't find you, and now that I found you and you have a Tuesday class, I will be there. Yeah, I'm giving. Uh, I've been successful on every time. Every time I do, they don't even send me. A, they sent me a three thousand dollar. You know this house I got that I took over. I did a hostile takeover on it. The, uh-huh. the attorneys sent me a 3000 They represent Hawthorne Estates because this is a gated community. They sent me a $3,000 property tax bill. And I did a contention. You got to read this letter I sent them. Never heard from them again. You know something I did that was close to that, okay, and, and I still didn't know what I was doing, but I, I heard someone ask about closed account checks. Did you uh, know that California is not a state? That California is a territory? Why do you think they're doing all these foreclosures? Did you know that that that, that California was never properly ceded to, to to the United States under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? That's still a territory. Yeah. Did you know they changed Article Nine and Article Six and Article Eight and Article Ten of of the that all all Mexicans were to be made American citizens under the treaty. They took that section out. And that they were to be granted all their land grants, they took that section out. They changed the whole treaty without the permission of President Polk. Nicholas Trist did this under contract with the Senate without the approval of the president, so it's not valid. The president has to approve all treaties. Wow. So none of these court decisions, none of these courts have any jurisdiction to do anything. None whatsoever. The real party in interest is, is the uh, uh, the president of Mexico. Go download the Treaty of Hidalgo. I uh, uh, wish I had time to go into it. You know, I when, go when into you, this in my classes. When you when you mentioned okay. that when you mentioned that, uh, and I have one last question that's probably real quick. But when you mentioned about the the um, the courts, um, I forgot what I want to ask here, but let me ask you my question. So my last question here. Uh, about ten years ago, someone, well, someone earlier mentioned about the closed account check, and I want to see if that was something that just was a quirk or was it something real about it. I used a closed account check with a court in Riverside, California, and it was for the fine. Once they convicted me, I didn't know what I was doing. It was my first time going through the redemption process. And they fined me twenty one hundred and fifty dollars, and they kept sending me a bill saying that they were the creditors. They were my creditors. They kept, the bill said your creditors on every one they sent me, and they said if I didn't come in and pay the bill, that they would send out a warrant for my arrest. So I went in, and when I went in, it was a pro tem, and the commissioners and the judges that I knew who knew me there, because I'd been there, I was there like every other day uh, for almost a year. Uh, they weren't there, and the pro tem didn't know why he was there. And when he said all I had to do was pay it, I asked him what form. He said, you could pay it by cash, check. But I said, I'll give you a check. So I gave him a closed account check. I went down to the clerk, paid on a closed account check, wrote what I need to write on there, went back up, and that was it. Then about a month later, they uh, said I need to go in and talk to financial services. When I went to talk to them, they said it was balanced. I said, you're paid. I don't need to pay you anything. You're already paid. Don't bother me. And I left, and I kept looking on the Internet, and they said they were going to file a warrant for my arrest. Nothing ever happened. They voided it out. Now, what did that mean, that they voided that out? They said they voided it out, and I've never heard from them since. They've never bothered me. Yeah. What did they, that mean, they voided it out? Well, they voided they, it. They made it disappear. Voided the judgment. So they just voided it with a closed account check. That's what case. you can do under 473D on all these unlawful detainers. They're void judgments on their face because they never had the authority. Ask them if they have 50% of the certification and acknowledgement by 50% of the owners of the notes. And who are the owners of the notes or the securities that they're they're foreclosing on? Ask them if they're a holder in due course. Okay. 
Ask them if they took it subject to the defenses and claims that the payer could assert against the payee. Say, isn't that true under 16 CFR, under the Federal Trade Commission, Section 433.2, that you took it subject to all the defenses and claims of the, that the payer could assert against the payee? Is that true or not? Yes or no? <laughs> hmm. You want to see a fanny pucker? Well, thank you very much, Jane. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Oh, thank you, Dallas. Have a good one. Okay, moving on, we have uh, Oregon. Go ahead, Oregon. Do you have a question for Gene? Hey, Gene, good to hear you. Thanks for having me on, Angela. I hope I'm sounding all right. Well, I wish I could... Barely. We, we need you to get up real close to your mic because it sounds like you're a million miles away. Okay. Um, could you repeat that last CFR that you mentioned? 16, volume 16, 433.2 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Go into the electronic, type in electronic Code of Federal Regulations. Electronic <clears throat> signature also. Act. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. That, that's all the Electronic Signature Act, right? No, that's the disclaimer that they have to... You mean, Are you talking about the UETA? Uniform Electronic Transfer Act? Right. And isn't that it what you said under 16 CFR? Yeah, no, that's 16, 16 CFR is the disclaimer that they take it subject to all defenses and claims. You should ask them that when you go into these four venue. Say, didn't you take that subject to all my defenses and claims? Well, here's my defenses and claims. <laughs> well, watch them cringe. I love you, man. Tell them you watch your proceeds from the sale of the security. Yeah, that's what I want. Where's the check? <laughs> yeah, where's the check? All right, is that it for you? Yeah, I'm good. I appreciate it. I'll see you on Tuesday. And okay, great. Now, that you say, Almighty bless. Yeah, but I, I wish everybody let him teach instead of getting off on. I mean, I know everybody's got personal issues, but wow. Well, he'll Thank teach you. on his class. <laughs> yep. Well, All right, thanks so much. Go ahead, Gene. What were you going to say? Well, people need to, to learn how to handle themselves. Yeah. I've actually got one of these forms filled out, these 4490 forms. <laughs> I found one that's filled out. It filed okay. with the... I'm going to save this, save this to my computer. That's that 4490 form. That's the uh, IRS form proof of claim. Yeah, this is a bankruptcy court. Yeah, they, they actually filled this out, they filed it with the court. District, it's in the district court of the District of, Col of Colorado. Receivership. Okay. You want to take some more questions? Yeah, now I'm going to fold up. What One more mean? question. Well, we've got three people. Okay. I'll take three of them. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay, beloved or beloved, go ahead. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can hear you. I, I was growing medical marijuana, and I had um, the cards and patients and they came in and took my harvest, and they took my safe that had um, $30,000 worth of gold coins, and they confiscated my car. And I didn't know. I ended up having a 
hire an attorney, but how would I have been able to get my things back? Who's who's they? The um, Drug Enforcement Code. DEA? Yeah. Well, do, do a 4490 on them, proof of claim. You can do a, you didn't lay claim to us, so it's abandoned property. Go read uh, uh, mitigation and go into Title 8. They do it under Title 18, Section uh, 981, did, 982, 983. I don't know what they did it under. It was under the um, health code. <clears throat> well, it's a forfeiture. Yes, that was the big thing. You had 20 days to post post bond, and then they kept my bond money, too. But no, what you have to do is file an NREM. They do it under Supplementary Rule C. You didn't file an NREM complaint laying claim to the property to, to mitigate it, and uh, so they, they, they take it, and they take the proceeds. It's abandoned property. Well, I didn't abandon it. I, I put the bond money up, and my attorney negotiated with them, which was totally unfair. So I didn't know what to do in the situation. I, I It's too late to do anything now, but I wanted to know what I should have done. You should have filed a claim. You should okay. have never hired an attorney. They're yeah. dumb. That's why they got Mack Truck tattooed on their forehead. Yeah, they're in bed together. And they're liars. You know how you can tell when they're lying? How? Their lips are moving. <laughs> and how do we get... I'm, I'm having a hard time getting signed up for your class. you you got to email Toby. Okay. Skype, Toby.Butterworth. Uh, Angela has it on her website, how to sign up. Okay. I've been trying to get in there with her, her website, but um, it didn't work. www.myprivateaudio.com. Okay, very good. Thank you. You're welcome. And then it's just on the right upper portion, it says Gene Keating about tonight's call. Click on that, and it'll take you to a page where it'll show you um, Toby's name to Skype for and also the PayPal address. Would, and, uh, will we be able to do it other than tonight, or does it have to get enrolled tonight? No, you can do it. I think he takes, what, all the way up to the day of the thing, right? Yeah, as long as you get in there until you can rest. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's just got, you just have to give him enough turnaround time to send you, I guess, the link and password to the, cause I guess each person gets their own distinct link. To the yeah, webinar. I'm I'm not good with the computer, so thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm not it's not either. too difficult. It's not difficult though. It's not a. You'll get the hang of it. Alrighty, was that it for you, hey. dear love? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on. Teresa, hi Teresa. Did you have a, a question for Jean? Yes, hi Jean. Hi. Um, you're a wonderful teacher. I heard a tape from you from years ago. Somebody forwarded it to me. And you're just the best teacher on the planet as far as I'm concerned. I've heard a lot of um, teachers, and you really are dynamite. And I'm so honored and pleased to hear you tonight and be able to talk um, Thank you. to you and to hear all this. I'm just, um, I've listened to a few <laughs> bad advice, I guess. It started out when I listened to... Winston Schrout's, uh coaches that I paid for to uh, show me how to do the OID process, and that ended up in a, uh, a tax lien of 100% since last May. And uh, it's been pretty terrible, even though um, Winston doesn't teach that anymore. The damage is done, and I just really think that the coaches that charge that money should have come back and shown how to undo the uh, you they, know the the damages and they no one stepped up to the plate or did that and then just recently I listened to David Clarence tell me that I could write some checks on an account um so I wrote checks on an open account and that 
it ended up closing. The bank ended up closing the accounts. And one of the checks I wrote recently, of course, after I tried to call David back, he d decided to no longer answer his phone anymore. That was nice of him to step up to the plate, too. But a medical bill for $350 of my sons, I wrote a check, you know, a negative check for that one. And um, now I got this letter yesterday from from the medical um, place saying that I had to pay the 300 and whatever, $24 plus a $20 bounce fee. And on top of that, if I didn't pay it within, I don't know, like five days or something like that, that they were going to send the police over to my house. So, um <laughs> I've listened to all the wrong people, and I'm so grateful that you have this class coming up because $25 is affordable. It's something I can do, and I'm, I'm just I'm not going to listen to any of these people anymore at all. You're just absolutely wonderful, and thank you. You're welcome. Thank and you, what, dear. And what can you what, and what and what what can you tell me about these these backward checks? And um, you know, I don't want the police showing up at my house. And I have an IRS 100% lien anyway. I thought maybe I'd write back to them and say, well, you know, if you want to call the police, that's fine, but they're not going to get anything from me because I have a 100% lien. And a 100% lien means no matter what I, where I work, I can't give them anything. What you should do is, is use the bill as a check. You will pay to the order of. It's not even a bill. It's a letter written. It's a le it's, it's just a letter written that they're going to call the, send the police after me. Okay. Do they have an amount on the bill? He, um, it's it, it's written in a letter form. Yeah, three hundred and eighty twenty four dollars or something like that. Do a pay to the order up. Okay. It's a bill. Hmm. Or a bull. In in, in ecclesiastical law, they call it a bull. I'm not kidding you. That's where the word bill comes from, bull. It's a propel bull. Endorsement for payment. Say pay to the order of uh, the Department of Treasury. Then charge it to whoever sent you the bill. Then credit to the memory of my account and put your Social Security number on there. I the did memory, huh? I did a $80,000 judgment against the court. Never heard from him again. And do I write that slanted across the page in red ink? Yeah, sign it in red ink. Don't ever sign anything in blue ink. And make sure you're the last signature on the page. Never do anything in blue ink. Oh, that's what I've been doing wrong all along. Sure. Yeah, uh -huh. you're doing... That's why in ancient times they used to prick their finger... And then they, they, they would write it, they would take the quill, put the blood on their finger, and they'd sign it in blood, red. That's the sign of a live man. A dead man can't, if you sign it in blue ink, you're a dead man. Oh, boy. Gosh. I've been doing it all wrong all along. Well, yeah, no we all have been, jam, I guess. Huh? Yeah, I sent a judge, you got to read this letter I sent to this district court judge. Well, I'll be on you in your class, that's for sure. And, uh, and everything has to be in red ink, and it has to be the last signature. And what people do is when they notarize something, they put the notary after their signature. The only signature they see, last in time is first in line. You never sign your your signature. Your signature has to be the last signature on the page. That's why you turn it over and sign it on the back, bottom back corner of the last page. So they can't sign anything after your signature. And you want to do it red ink, red ink. I can show you an IRS practice manual that says every document has to be signed in red ink. Beautiful. So watch the difference. Sign it in red ink and then watch the difference. So pay to the order of the Department of Treasury and charge it to the medical facility. Now charge the sum to the to the account of the medical and write their account number down there. The account number is the bill number. Charge it to account number. Uh, and put the name uh, and put their, if you have their, do a W-9 on them. <laughs> you, want to, you want to see how fast these pe people, you want, all you'll see is, is, is two elbows and a fanny <laughs> going down the street. I love that one. <laughs> oh, burn rubber. I laugh at these people. They don't. They don't. None of them bother me anymore. 
Yeah, see, although I've, I bet I've written over two dozen letters, and, and he never, I never hear from him again after I write the letter. So I could just do the W nine without the uh, pay to the order of, or, or what? Yeah, I'd do the pay to the order of, and then ask them for their taxpayer identification number, and tell them you want to see the ten ninety nine OID to identify the source of the funds. Or you can do a conditional acceptance on proof of claim. Tell them it, 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 I want to see the ten ninety nine OID that identifies you as the source of the funds. Or Mhm. Excellent. Oh. Identifies me as the funder. Yeah, identifies them as the funder. They're sending you a bill. If they're not the source of the funds, what are they sending you a bill for? Mhm. Tell them to send you a check for the funds that you gave them. You funded them. Mhm. <laughs> Tell them you'll pay it. You'll send them a check tomorrow. The, the instant you get the the OID, if they tell them to send you the copy of the 1099 OID that identifies them as the source of the funds, mm-hmm. and that you're the recipient, and you'll write them out a check to they. You'll never hear from them again. Tell them if you don't, if they don't send you the OID, you're going to file one with the IRS showing them as the recipient of the funds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. You know what that is? A margin call. That's what I did on this judge. I did a margin call on him. I, I said, "Give me, send me the 1099 OID that shows you as the source of the funds." Never heard from him again. <laughs> them as the source and me as the recipient and if they and then and then I should write and if you do send me you know this so OID, why they have to send you the 1099 OID because that identifies because that shows you as the owner of the tax yes I yeah I understand that mm-hmm. okay so if you're not the recipient of the funds then you don't owe them the money do you no well then tell them to go fly a kite you tell them if they don't do it, you're going to do it, and then you're going to have the IRS, you're going to sick the IRS on them. How do you like me now? <laughs> you are so wonderful. Well, yeah, know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Excellent. Thank you, thank you so much. I feel so much better. Thank you, Angela. Oh, good. You're both, oh, you're you're welcome. both so wonderful. I hope the two of you are on from now till eternity. <laughs> All oh, the time. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> well, thank you so I'll much. I'll listen to you so every other week. <laughs> thank you, dear. You're very sweet. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. All right. Good night. See you on Tuesday. Okay, New York, go ahead. Did you have a question? This was the last one. Okay. Uh, New York. Did you have a question for Jean? Yeah, Mr. Jean, my first time on the call. I'd like to know, how do you deal with an IRS levy? Uh, levy is a is secret lien. When they uh-huh. assess the tax, the, the lien, when they bring a claim, do a 4490 on them. Tell them to prove up their claim. Uh-huh. They're dipping into your account just like you if they got a levy on them, tell them to send you a bill and then do a pay a pay a pay order on it, money order. Uh-huh. What they're doing is uh, they're levying my pension. Well, tell them to send you the, uh, the uh, you got you got a bill for them for the amount of the tax? Uh, yeah, they claim I owe, uh, with penalties and interest and all that, they claim I owe them so many hundreds of thousand dollars. Well, do a pay to the order of. Mm-hmm. And then charge it to the to their account, and and it credit the memory of your account. Uh huh. File file a ten ninety nine OID. Not a OID. Okay. Showing them as the recipient of the funds. Uh huh. Showing the IRS as the recipient of the funds. 1099 OID. And uh, 
When, when have you ever seen anybody assess the IRS as tax? Never. Well, they're sending you a bill, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Well, what's your first clue? They're using your credit, so bill, bill them for the tax. They're no okay. di- they're no different than anybody else. Uh-huh. How would you what do if- that, Gene? How would you bill them for the tax? Send them a bill. Do a money order. That's how you do it. Take their bill and do a money order. That's assessing the tax. Now they have to either pay the tax, tell them you're going to file an OID on them. File the OID on them. Show them as as a recipient of the funds. What is a 4490, uh, Gene? Proof of claim. Uh Uh-huh. Go read it. Go read the internal. I got two practices here. The Internal Revenue Manual 5.5.1 and 5.5.4.1. There's two of them here. Proof of claim procedures in decedent and non-bankruptcy insolvency cases. This is an insolvency case because there you're dealing with a dead person. And under, go read 3128 of Title 31. 3128, Title, okay. And, thir, and 3113. When, it, when there's proof that the, that the person, that's proof that, that they can draw on the payment and get the payment for the for the estate. Mm-hmm. Because the person is... Where can I get an IRS manual from to look at all the codes and statutes and everything? You can get it right offline. Okay. On the website, yeah. Go to Cornell Law. They got Title 26 in there. Mm-hmm. Can I can, can I uh, buy the manual outright from somewhere? Yeah, you can buy it from West Westlaw. They have they have the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Code of 1986. Okay. You can probably get it real cheap. Get it in paperback. Okay. Thanks, Jane. You're welcome. Okay, great. Okay. Dave. Let me see here. Just Dave. Go ahead. Hey, Dave. Hello. Hey. Hello, Jane. Yeah, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Hey, I have got a question for you, and I don't know whether you have an answer, but this is a question that I've been asked so many times, and I have discussed with some other researchers, and that is the question about a possibility of going back and getting the funds that were paid on credit cards in the past. You could make a claim, yeah. Do you think that's a viable claim that you you could uh, have a process to pursue. Uh, Personally, I've got an American Express card that I used to use a lot, and I ran over 800,000 through it. Yeah, I can get you the whole 800,000 back. That works for me. I'm already signed up for Tuesday. That's all I wanted to know. Yeah. Thank you. They do the same thing on a credit card that they do on a mortgage loan. Right. The DTC owns both sides of the account, Mm -hmm. which is the security. Security. Very good. I think there's a lot of people out there who'd be very interested in learning that process. The DTC is a trust holding company. They're holding all that money in trust because you haven't laid a claim to it under Article 8. Better late than never. Amen. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dave. Okay, our last one. Uh, James one two three four. Did you have a question before we wrap it up here? James one two three four. J A M E one two three four. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Keith. How are you doing this evening? Good. I'm doing good. How about you? Okay. Can you? Utilize a process to um, get rid of a fine that was assessed 
as a part of a uh, uh, being convicted on a felony, uh, a fraudulent uh, frame up, and uh, they assessed like a fourteen thousand dollar fine, and um, of which I paid uh, maybe a couple of payments, and I couldn't make any more payments, and I got a letter saying that. Uh, the payments were suspended. They were trying to pull me back into uh, the uh, the system, and um, I since uh, decided that uh, uh, I didn't want a contract anymore, and I refused to sign some other paperwork. And now they're telling me I'll be locked up if I don't uh, continue Who, to pay the fourteen thousand uh, the district court, uh, the local uh, attorney general. The local judge that handled the case and the probation officers. Tell them you want a 1099 OID. <laughs> okay. Should Tell I him you, you could definitely accept his offer to play the entire indebtedness on proof of claim. Okay, and what they're asking me is to pay it only by postal money order. Okay, ask them where they get the authority to ask you to pay, pay with a specific instrument. Okay. Okay, should I put this in writing and hand it to them? You should do a conditional acceptance on proof of claim. I could get rid of that in 30, in 30 minutes. You should come out of the class to show you how to do a letter and get rid of it. Okay, I get rid of everything. I do want to get these disappears. Oh man, that's wonderful. I will be in that class on, uh, on I think you said uh, Tuesday? On Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday night, yeah. Or Tuesday afternoon. Okay. 30 to 8. Yeah. And sometimes okay. we. Well, I think. See, we have three tapes, but we can probably do, uh, you know, do it more. We use up, use up three tapes. It lasts for three tapes, last for three. I guess it's an hour for each tape. <clears throat> oh, what a wonderful there. And the one other question real quick. Is there any way that um, I, I guess you can uh, totally, uh, uh, um, I guess, remove uh, a frame-up felony charge from your record uh, of the straw man? Yeah, expungement. Get it and does that process, does that process uh, cover it uh, in any, uh, any classes that will be covered or previously has been covered? We haven't gone into that previously, but I can show you how to do that. Okay. Okay, I thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Toby just put a list in the... Uh, Skype of, I guess, previous um, Toby, are those the previous archives of uh, Gene's classes? Yeah, there's a, there's an archive in there. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put that. Should I put that in the chat in case anyone wants to yeah. order them? Yeah. Oh, my chat is frozen here. There we go. If I can do this. Try that. I have to give you a raise. <laughs> We've got one more question. Can you handle it? Yeah, or then I'm going. I got a call. All right. It's too late. Okay, Daniel Ray, go ahead. I have a really simple question. Can we purchase uh, back webinars? Yes. I, I just put the link on the chat. Actually, um, if you, I'll, I'll. Uh, I guess I'll put it on the website um, in the next day or so. Check the myprivateaudio.com website and click on guest speakers up at the top. And down at the bottom of that page is Gene's information. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's easier for you. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's a wrap. It's been fun. You covered a lot of... Uh, Territory, I was surprised. You did real good, Gene. Thank you for staying on track and not going all over the place. <laughs> it was good. And um, I'm sure many of uh, the participants and listeners are going to be 
joining up for your class. I'm going to be there on Tuesday night. See how it goes. Um, I can't wait, actually. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll have other calls, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to end the call. Thank you for for spending three hours and 14 minutes with us. We'll do it again, I'm sure, and we'll see you on Tuesday. And everybody, um, be sure, be sure to sign up at least for the first one. See what it's like. You might learn something. Gee, what a novel concept. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. I'll see Thank you on you. Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I love you all. Love you, too. Thanks. Good night, Jean. Good night. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you.